Hello, and welcome to another episode of Broadcasts from Fiddler's Green, my weekly podcast here at the channel, The Distributist. I'm your host, Dave. <laughs> I always feel like I should have one of those typical podcast intros, at least until people can tell me in the chat that my audio isn't completely messed up, which I think after doing this for about three months, it probably isn't. But nevertheless, I feel like I have to check with the chat to make sure that my microphone isn't not going or something like that. So this is going to be a very strange episode of broadcasts because usually I have some kind of topic from the headlines or something that I want to talk about more abstractly. But today I really want to talk to you, the audience, or to the distant right generally. I was going to kind of come up here and give a kind of Alec Baldwin from Glen Gary and Glen Ross speech about how oh, we're not being serious enough and uh, you know we, we have to we have to get our head in the game and all this stuff but um i got like three hours of sleep last night for a variety of reasons both professional and uh, family related so it's it's not going to be a, a good time to bust out the brass balls and the you know coffee is for closers routine it's going to be a little bit more laid back here but since i still haven't really got the um okay so the audio is good get the go ahead from the chat but uh, you know just to continue on with with the theme for tonight um i i'll give some background here and uh, so over the last few weeks i've been trying to catch up on my live stream queue i have a number of conversations i've been wanting to have with a variety of people a lot of people who come from earlier iterations of youtube uh previously on the channel i host fritz imperial who's one of the first people in our sphere of kind of um you know, back then we called it neo-reaction or traditionalism. Now people call it dissident, right? It's changed. I also talked to the Franklin, another sort of old time, uh, you know, friend of the channels, a person who had a channel uh, and then remade his channel right around the same time I started mine. And I've been thinking a lot about how things have progressed, basically where we've come from when I started my YouTube channel in 2016 and what really needs to happen. And this has kind of been set off by a variety of things that happened online as well. Uh, the most, I think, pertinent event that's happened obviously in the last week has been the death of Queen Elizabeth and her subsequent burial. And sort of coterminous with that, the, I mean, I should say that the other, the other thing is, um, so there's, there's the death of Queen Elizabeth and her burial and then there's a variety of other really strange stories. None of them are really remarkable in, in their own right, but they kind of paint a picture of the world that we're occupying. I'll just go down the line. The first one that comes to mind, at least, is um, is the whole story about Martha's Vineyard and the the Ron DeSantis, uh, the the Ron DeSantis's decision to ship, I think it was 50 immigrants to Martha's Vineyard and the hijinks that ensued. The, the the media, of course, the cathedral spinning this uh, as fast as they possibly can. These immigrants, very small in number, were deported from the resort town basically 48 hours later. They, they barely spent a fortnight there, and then they got shipped off to some military detention facility at the behest of the National Guard, which was called in instantly. Then there are a variety of really bizarre stories. There was one regarding a teacher uh, this is sort of a typical libs of TikTok story that had co come to uh, school sort of wearing these, this absolutely enormous pair of fake breasts, uh, something that you'd see in some kind of sh sex shop. There's no way this is an authentic representation of women. This person is maybe transgender, but is really on a much more deeper level, obviously trolling. And, and of course, from that point, a very obvious news cycle starts up and you get the typical actors making the typical responses. You, you already know the routine. You know, Libs of TikTok says something. And of course, the mainstream Spurky left fires back with, uh, with uh, you know, BreadTube and the other sort of LARPy radicals kind of sounding, sounding a note of harmony, but not saying anything different than the mainstream ever does, just repeating the lines of both uh, the corporate establishment and also the State Department, depending on the context. And then, you know, uh, to follow it all up, you have the strange news coming out of Ukraine, this 
seeming Russian defeat looming on the horizon, and behind that, a looming energy crisis and a looming economic catastrophe. And I mean, all, all of this, what this all adds up to is just kind of this realization of where we are in, in, in the world and where we are online. Uh, in, in, in the real world, we're entering a time of hardship. We're entering a time where our societal conventions don't make any sense anymore. In, in the online space, we're having this continuous distraction with weird fascinations and, and clout wars and, and minor, minor events that, that capture the narrative. And they're not completely unrelated, as I want to get on to, but it does make you think about the process we've taken to get from where I started my channel in 2016 uh, to where I am now in, in, in 2022. Crossing over, I think, the channels like Seminole Year, which is 2018. And uh, not to add you know, more variables into the mix, but while all this was going on, while, while all these, this combination of, of clown world events and, and the serious foreboding news and then sort of the solemn, solemn marking of a, of a passing monarch, while all that was going on, you know, this, this perennially idiotic issue that I, un, I think I unwittingly kicked started up again. And this was the conversation between pagans and Christianity, or Christians and pagans, that continuously goes on on the distant right and never has any resolution. And, and you know, you really start questioning what, what are you ultimately getting from this conversation? Where are we moving with any of this? And... Um, <sighs> I don't know. I think that this 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 marks the this marks the need for some kind of conversation on how to go forward and how to change what we're doing. And that's the conversation I wanted to have. We can start with the whole neo pagan dialogue, because I, I, I this is something I deeply care about. Obviously, religion is my thing, and uh, the the problem is is that um, we get into sort of this debate mode. And I wrote an essay about neo-paganism, I think about three months ago, and I got a variety of responses that I really wasn't satisfied with. I think that there's a core misunderstanding of what I'm really asking for when I talk to pagans to get their responses. Uh, and, and I keep on hearing answers that aren't really what I'm trying to solicit. What, what I'm trying to solicit is, is a way of stabilizing the conversation so it doesn't have to go on anymore. Where, where we can say, like, this is what you believe, and this is what we believe, and here are our differences, and you can make your decision as adults. And we don't have to continuously go on about this, because it, it really doesn't have any material interest for us. The, the response I got back, I had one response from a blogger called Raging Mandrill, which is a good response, but I, I read through it, and I kind of... I mean, there were several things. The, the first thing was that... that the the response was a little bit soft. I'll put it that way, right? So um, th there there were a number of positions. So when, when you're a person who does a lot of debate, and when you're inter when you are used to sort of this back and forth that goes on in dialectics and contentious conversations, when you put forward an argument, oftentimes as someone who's really used to this thing, you kind of test it out in your mind. You anticipate the responses. You anticipate what it would be like to defend this position if you're in a public environment and what the response of the audience is. And, and there were two sort of main issues with this. So, you know, what, what I got this response from Raging Mandrill, the immediate thing was live stream debate, live stream debate, live stream debate. And, uh, I don't think that this was really the appropriate thing to do because if this was 2018, I can think of a few debates I had back in the high, the heyday of the original internet blood sports, and it was really fun. And you know what you you do is you take these arguments and you go right to the soft points. You go right to the soft points and 
to sort of continue on the, the first digression I made, the soft points are the areas of another person's argument that don't look like they've been well considered, that don't look like they've been tested in your opponent's mind very well. They sounded good on paper, they sounded good in environments where everyone's kind of agreeing with you and nodding along, but you know that these things aren't going to stand up rhetorically and furthermore, uh, the, the common arguments that, that you make just kind of roll right over them. Uh, but, but this is, you know, kind of putting this into a live debate and, and kind of flattening, you know, a pa the pagan's arguments is, that's kind of like stupid, right? Because all it does is, is get people continuing on in this, this debate environment, the debate mode they've found themselves in. It's going to get a lot of pagans really angry, and then they're going to come back and they're going to write more Spurgy articles about uh, Christianity being, you know, slave morality, all this stuff. Um, that's not really what I'm interested in doing. I, I want, to, like, I understand that pagans have complaints about Christianity. I understand that they're well considered, and I want to genuinely understand what they believe theologically. I want to genuinely believe what they feel like they're drawing from spiritually. I want to hear about that. And I also want to, I want to know the reasons that they, they believe what they believe, sort of earnestly. And I want, to, I want to kind of draw that out. I want to, not only do I want to encounter sort of the steer, steel man uh, in, in terms of apologetics from that side, I also want to just hear the story of how they came to these beliefs. And, and this was not going to be generated by a debate, by, by any stretch of the imagination. This is not going to be generated by having another debate. Uh, I, I don't, like the arguments I get online when we're in some kind of contentious mode don't match up reasons for actually believing in religion. Uh, you, don't, you don't believe in on paganism because you know, you've determined that Christianity is slave morality. Uh, slave morality is a practically meaningless term that it, it, I've heard everything call, called slave morality. Uh, and, and now, thanks, th thanks to the fact that Michel Foucault is sort of the last iteration of Nietzschean ideas in the academy, the, the, more, the most common things I've heard called slave morality are things like monogamy, having children, and sacrifice for your family. Uh, I don't know if this conversation can be had, but, but the kind of back and forth that was seen between academic agent and, and a variety of sort of the Christian skeptics and, and and sort of the Christian apologist is just it was just diseased. It was diseased in the sense that uh, you know it, it was it was occurring right at the time where the queen was being buried, or her, the preparations for her burial were afoot, and in the, in the middle of sort of this solemn ceremony, closing the closing of an era. A ceremony where even died in the world atheists are kind of having a moment of silence and considering the implications that the 20th century is now truly over. We're having this weird conversation about, you know, like why Christianity is bad because it comes, it's, it has it has Hebrew elements in it or something like that. Like this is this is not serious. This is not sort of an adult conversation, and it's not what we really should be looking towards. The two articles, uh, the the, you know, the very same week that did catch my eye, th that were kind of going in the right direction, highlighted kind of the seriousness of the moment we're in. the The serious of the moment we're in is outlined by a certain amount of powerlessness and a certain amount of of starkness. Stark realities are returning in a big way. And yet at the same time, we don't really have the right tools to deal with them. And the two articles I'm thinking of here are Alex Gashuda's article on deatomization and Morgoth's article on excess death rates. So as everyone, well, a lot of people know, there's been a huge, huge, huge spike mysteriously in excess deaths that has occurred across the Western world, and no one can yet account for it. And, you know, Morgoth in a Substack essay that could certainly not make it past the YouTube censors speculates on the possible causes for this mass increase in mortality, which m might not be, you know, am amissable by the, the, the authorities and certainly would be censored if I said it explicitly. 
but you, you can you can already kind of come up with some choice reasons for this. And you know, thinking thinking across these issues, I kind of had this moment <laughs> where. Uh, it, there's always this question that that come that that strikes me as the essential one that all CEOs ask. I, it's a quote from Colonel Curtis LeMay, who was one of the bigwigs behind the Allied bomber campaign in World War II. But it, it's a question that he often asked walking into a room when he wanted to refocus the senior staff on the mission at hand. And I imagine this is a question that that a lot of CEOs ask when 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 they when they come into a room, because it, the, the question of looking at the big picture is this essential. And the question is, uh, what are we doing here? <laughs> like, why are we here? Why are you listening to me? Why does the distant right online community exist? What are we trying to accomplish? What What's the whole point of this endeavor? I mean, I appreciate the super chats. I understand that this is entertainment to a certain extent, but periodically we have to remind ourselves, like, what is it we're actually trying to accomplish? And how are the conversations we have actually moving this conversation forward? And this is the thing. Obviously, there's the grand negative goal that academic agent constantly lists of clear them all out, of some kind of regime change to a healthier system that, that would kind of sweep away the old world and reinstitute something that is at least a little bit rational and conducive to human health. But in all seriousness, you know, none of us can implement that. That's not actually where we are right now. This is a fledgling movement. This is early days. We're just sort of getting used to being dissidents, getting used to seeing ourselves as adversarial to the, uh, to, to, to the world, to the powers that be, after thinking that we could reform them for so long. Heck, with the death of the queen, this year might be really the dawning of the 21st century properly in, in the same sense that you know the end of world war one was the dawning of the 20th century properly obviously there's precursors in 2001 and 2012 i would argue but but this this we, we are at a stepping off point and none of ours are ready to to clear anything out so so what are we doing here i would argue you know i can i can't speak for everyone here at least what I'm trying to do, is what we're trying to do is we're trying to develop our particular attitude, a particular attitude and approach to politics that goes against the grain of where the modern world is going. So the modern world is a certain way of practicing politics and encouraging life in the 21st century. One that emphasizes indolence and politics as a consumer product and assent to sort of all of these liberalist assumptions that keep the engine going and really going with the flow when it comes to things that are frankly untrue. The project of the distant right is to break from this pattern in, in radical ways. And kind of speaking to this point in light of Alex Kashuda's article, I would argue that there are three ways that we're kind of trying to break from this. And this is the title of this conversation here. And the problem is that the, these, these objectives are at odds with each other. Because we're the distant right, uh, I, I phrase these three objectives in purely negative terms. But you could, you could conceptualize them as positives too. And the, the three objectives we're trying to pursue are dissent, deatomization and detachment, or you could say detach, deatomize, and dissent. Uh, I'll review them briefly. Uh, so detachment could be just reconceptualized as the pursuit of health, both physical, spiritual, and, communi uh, and communal. The modern world is corrosive to what it means to be human. It's corrosive to what it means to be human in a physical sense and in, and in like I said, a collective sense where we're dying as a species, our societies are draining away in terms of birth rates, and it's also corrosive to our bodies and the fact that we're living indolent lifestyles. Insofar as that we're going to react to this world, these processes of implicit degeneration have to be broken from. They have to be kind of, we have to kind of see these temptations emerge in front of us, and we kind of have to 
we have to kind of, we, we have to say no to them. We have to detach from this process and go in a different direction. And I would say that this is fundamentally different in a big way from dissent, which is uh, dissent, as I would characterize it, is the attempt to find a true guiding ideology or a true guiding religion and, and to kind of use it to expose the manifest falsehoods of our current reigning moral and political order. Uh, this is the great project of the dissident right. And also, I should say, not only to find this guiding religion, but also to bring it forcefully into the public square and, and to make it unignorable by, by the authorities. And uh, again, this is the project of the distant right, and it has to be conceptualized as being something negative because we don't really know what the positive position is, or we don't, we, the, the viable positive positions are kind of coming into focus. But because we're still learning a proper language with which to speak to each other, we don't really have a good handle on, on what it ultimately means to dissent in, in a proper way. Uh, what's a correct and healthy way to dissent and what's just kind of LARPing, what's kind of going on and on in these circles uh, that, that, that's kind of meaningless in the larger project of creating an alternative vision. And the final one, and one I think that I, I really don't want to neglect because this has been a major part of my own life, a uh, major failure to some regards, but you know there's been some successes. And that's the objective of deatomization. This is what Alex Kashuda called out in her recent article and what I, I kind of want to uh, talk about a little bit. It's, it's much harder to, obviously. But after COVID in particular, we are radically individualized to a degree that is really not healthy for humans. And furthermore, as I mentioned to, I think Fritz Imperial, in my conversation with him, it's really obvious at this stage that the, the atomization brought about by COVID actively helped the, the cathedral. It actively helped the establishment. It gave them exactly what they wanted. It gave them an opposition that was confused and didn't know how to conceptualize itself anymore. It gave cover for their own radicals to further step in. Uh, radicals is kind of a misnomer because they're, they're, they're really just going with the, the power. But it, 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 it gave their own radical um, their own radical believers, let's call them, uh, an ability to, to sort of cement their radicalism in isolation. To say all of these insane things that would have gotten immediate pushback in a broader social environment and to sort of double down on them. Oh yeah, sure, it's fine. We, we need to we need to de-police the cities. We need to go all in on on trans 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 women's uh, tra transgender story hour or drag queens not transgender story hour drag queen story hour. It's much more radical than transgender story hour. We need to talk about trans kids. We need, to, we need to go all in on firing people because they don't want to take an experimental vaccine. Across the entire federal government, across many professions, we can, we can do this for, through OSHA, it's fine. We can disown our own children for not, for not taking a, a drug. And, and we can tear apart communities that have been there for hundreds of years and, and, and completely destabilize our economy in the name of a, a, an insane war in Eastern Europe and a very poorly understood plan to confront climate change. Uh, these are all insane positions, but the atomization of this, the atomization of our society has made insanity something that is, is actually a, a, a social asset because so much of our social assets are mediated through, through the social media apparatus controlled by the, our, our enemies. Fighting back against these trends is the objective of everyone here. And I, I speak to people right now, and it's probably not the most entertaining live stream, but I think it's essential. I speak to people right now knowing that this isn't the left, this isn't Tucker Carlson. Really, when we talk to each other, we're all in the same boat together trying to figure this stuff out. But there are tensions in the project. And this is something that, that I think I've come to realize. These are three ways that we need to break free, but they're also kind of radically in opposition to each other. The more you dissent, the harder it is to deatomize because culture is completely dominated by the, by the Moors 
is it by the, by the Moors, by by the standards of the mainstream and by the very ideas that we're trying to rage against or we're trying to speak out against. More than a few times in my time on the East Coast, I've hit it off with somebody for a variety of reasons, and then they just casually drop how horrible they think people who don't like using gendered pronouns or, or don't like using neo pronouns are. And after you hear that, you just kind of take a, you take, take a step back and you have to cross that one off the list because, I mean, the question is, how, how are you going to de-atomize with somebody who's already prejudged you as being fundamentally immoral? Uh, furthermore, uh, de-atomization and attachment are also have attention to them as well. Uh, de-atomization, the, the easiest things to get involved with, sometimes can be a little bit unhealthy. Uh, think of fan communities, uh, where where by by being part of a fan community, and by kind of getting emotionally involved in a consumer product, which is in sometimes it's the easiest way to meet people, you're also kind of very consciously losing sight of a core way which modernity ma modernity makes you inert and irresponsive to to larger ideological problems. You're setting yourself up for that. And finally, between dissent and detachment. Um, I mean, it's really all of social media, right? We have the problem of trolling. To be the perfect dissenter, in some sense, is a giant project of purity spiraling. But when you're doing that, you're also walking into all the sort of bad habits, the bad practices that kind of leave you isolated and backbinding. Ba backbiting, I should say. Um, in, in optimization, which is one of my specialties, we, we kind of call these trade-offs efficient frontiers. Uh, these are when you have two objective functions. Uh, the the trade-offs between the two objective functions create a, a, a frontier for which no movement in one direction can be accomplished. No, no further optimization in one direction can be accomplished without detracting from the other. And so the problem of, of coming to a best solution on this frontier is really not so much one of, of logistics, but one of wisdom. Do, do we know where it is best to de-atomize and where it's best to dissent, where, where, where it's right to focus on one's health and where it's right to actually strive for ideological purity? You can see this and you, know, you think like the ultimate, the ultimate detacher, the, one, the person who is perfectly de-atomized and detached probably would be someone like the Amish or a cloistered religious community that's in, that, that is actually a community. But at the same time, you're not dissenting. And the same thing is true for uh, the dissenter or the online dissenter who doesn't have any ability to build community among himself and to actually uh, break free of these constraints. I, I want people to kind of focus on this. I think, I think this is a worthwhile conversation to have. I know that more goths post about the excess deaths. He talks about a variety of tax that the cathedral could take to explain away the excess deaths. And, and he, he points out rightly, I think, that it's impossible to really, it's impossible to really, for the cathedral to admit any, um, any guilt on its own part. It, it can't move in that direction. Because any, any guilt on its own part immediately indicts them as, as being bad actors because they've already walked too far into their own radicalism. And when I read that from Morgoth, I, I thought to myself, well, it's actually much worse than that, right? This is sort of the, the, the grand evil of democracy and oligarchy, is that imagine, imagine it does turn out that these excess deaths stem from some combination of factors that the mainstream medical establishment literally created themselves, be it drugs they recommended or practices like shutting down, the shutting down of schools or, or by just the plain social isolation or by the deferment of necessary medical care because of quarantines and because uh, of unnecessary shutdowns across the medical establishment. The problem is, especially in terms of uh, when it comes to drugs they may have recommended or mandated, the problem is, is that every single person that went along with the mainstream media has themselves become a handmaid into this deception. And any admission across this on this on this point 
going to necessarily have to be an admission of guilt, not just by the establishment, but by the people who made themselves advocates on social media of that same establishment is, is, is the, is the woman who, who basically pressured her children or her sister or brother into taking a drug he didn't want to, uh, immediately going to turn around and say, yeah, I am sorry, that drug may have actually caused you to be at risk for, uh, for death. These people are going to line up and ask the establishment to lie to them. And they're going to believe anything that the establishment says because the alternative is going to be the realization that they're, they're guilty of a horrific, they're in part guilty of a horrific crime. The same thing is true for the trans children debate. The whole point is to get people on board with this, is, is to make them co-authors of, of the, the elite's crime so that when it's time to take stock, if this thing ultimately falls through, the, 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 the elite don't get shouldered with the, the consequences of their own decisions, but rather uh, the consequences of these decisions seem to be cast out over an entire broad range of people. It's not just the people at the top who made the decisions, it's everyone who vociferously supported them on social media. These are the consequences of living in an atomized society. These are the consequences of living in a broadly unhealthy society. And this is why I've become convinced that for the time being, there's not going to be a revolution in, in thought. There's not going to be a revolution in modes that's, that's going to come in some kind of sudden burst. It's just going to be the construction of alternative places where we can at least speak truthfully about things for, for a small period of time. And, and really, quite honestly, that began, I mean, obviously, we all have our projects in real life to deatomize. But it begins online, too. How can we create communities? How can we create spaces that are deatomized, but also do not partake in, frankly, unhealthy habits, and, and that actually create spaces where we can talk about truth? The three objectives that detach, deatomize, and dissent. I'm going to start again with how I conduct online conversations and straying away from debates. When there's a conversation that occurs online among right wingers, the point should be to clarify and congeal both sides of the argument, not to humiliate in a debate. I think the time for that is over. The time for parasocial contests of who has the most clout and who can slam the other person down as quickly as possible on a Twitch stream that really was the product of 2018. And, you know, I think, I think, I, I don't know exactly how we're going to facilitate this, this transition inside spaces that are managed online because certainly Telegram is terrible for that. And certainly Twitter is even worse for that. But I just don't think I can I can go through another one of these cycles where where we're where, mind, where, where we're either mindlessly reacting to some something that happened that that's objectionable and that we all know is going on, like the trans kids phenomenon in, in uh, Chicago's Children's Hospital, or or the um, or the the Martha's Vineyard stuff. And we get so outraged by this stuff, but but really like the. That, that's really the wrong... I mean, I guess you can preach to the choir. I guess you can shout loudly about this stuff. But what, what, you're, really, what you're really looking for is who actually is being convinced by this. Who, it, there's a variety of people that you want to actually have listen to you and respect you as a community member. And, and there's a variety of people that you want to have as allies. And no... Th the trans kid thing is not, is not earning new allies for you. The, the, everyone's already seen that. The question is how to incrementally move forward in a direction that, that breaks new ground. And, and these endless repetitions of outrage do nothing to actually make that objective, uh, take that objective a step forward. It does nothing to, to get you into a real life community where, where you can bring forward dissident ideas. And it doesn't seem to actually make the conversation healthier. 
The same thing is true for, there's also sort of an inverse paranoia I've noticed among a lot of conservatives or a lot of people who came from the conservative movement, like just in this Ron DeSantis thing. So Ron DeSantis, and this is, this is an attitudinal thing that I see all the time on the right wing. And I really want people to try to fix this. I sound like a dad giving it. This must be a pretty unpopular live stream because I'm getting 300 people. 300 people wanting to lecture you and what not to do in online conversations. Okay, it's fine. But, but a lot of, I can see this in a lot of former conservatives. It's happened in Roe v. Wade. This happened in, in, in this, this, this uh, in all, these, uh, all of these stunts. The, the right wing pulls off a victory in, in the short term. It's humiliating for the left. And you can, you can see the cathedral kind of gearing up. Its narrative gears are going into motion. And, and those of us who are, who are longtime participants in this conversation know that, that, that they're really going to get the conservatives back for this one. And they're way more powerful than that, them. And so everyone, they're way more powerful than us. And so everyone's waiting for the next shoe to drop. So people send me messages like, oh man, Dave, I'm really worried about this uh, the, this latest stunt that Ron DeSantis pulled off, sending migrants to 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 Martha's Vineyard, or, or I'm really worried about the Supreme Court ruling. I mean, this is gonna like this is gonna narratively explode in our faces. This is gonna the, like, there's gonna be something that happens, and it's gonna be blamed on on the Republicans, and this is gonna be a huge public relations fiasco for us. We're I mean, taking the wrong attitude. You're, taking, you're, you're acting like you're a stakeholder for the Republican Party, like the people in power represent you at all. Like you're, you're not representative of Ron DeSantis. He isn't your king. He, he, his crimes are not your crimes, if there are any. And th that's, not, that's not the point. And you're also not the Supreme Court either. Th this idea that, that something bad might happen in, in our immigration processing center and, and you know maybe maybe the bus that Ron DeSantis is having all of these immigrants shipped out on maybe it crashes or or maybe that there's a there's a botched back alley abortion in one state that 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 closed their planned parenthoods or something like that this is not something that you need to own you're acting like you're some kind of stakeholder for the government the point of all of this is that we need rational policies when it comes to managing reproduction, and we need rational policies when it comes to managing immigration, and that's a conversation you can have it with me. If you're willing, if you're willing to examine what we need to achieve as a country when it comes to restricting immigration, or when it comes to encouraging family formation in the case of abortion, or when it comes to managing sex and sexual attitudes, then that's a conversation we need to have. Uh, but but reacting to some kind of backlash, like you're the spin doctors that are working for uh, the Republican National Convention, that's not what dissidents do. It's not properly detached. It's not it's not having a healthy attitude towards politics either. You should avoid flexing at all times. In my unless you've actually won, which we're we're never going to actually win in our lifetimes, right? So probably never flex if you're a right winger. Uh, but but in, until you flex or until you say something really stupid publicly that makes you an owner of these decisions, these are just things that have happened, and they're not. They may not have ideal consequences, but nothing has ideal consequences in the system that we're involved in. The entire thing is completely corrupt and needs to be reformed. And maybe there's a conversation people can have with you on the necessary radical reforms that need to take place. But if they're not willing to have that conversation, you know, putting you online for the direction of a soundbite in, in, in one moment is insane. It's an insane way to approach politics. It's a childlike way to approach politics. And it's a product of the social media age. We're adults here, and we're trying to do the best for our communities. We need to establish the things that are true, that are good, that are beautiful, that we're actually fighting for. And in that realm, we're all just trying to make individual decisions as actors. So talk to me like an individual. Talk to me like a community member. Talk to me like someone who actually has autonomy about what they think and not as an element of some apparatus that you're trying to do, that you're trying to dunk on. I mean, that, that's how the conversations have to proceed, both online and in real life, because that's how adults have conversations. That's properly detached. 
that's the only thing that really, that's the only kind of meaningful conversation that can go through. But if you're trying to just, oh, are you, are you on the side of neo-pronouns or are you on the side of bigotry? That's not an interesting conversation. It's not an adult conversation. Are you in the pagan gang or are you on the Christian's side? That's a more meaningful conversation. That's an essential conversation. But the framing is all wrong. It's infantile. It's not something that actually that, that actually moves anything forward. And it, it reminds me just, just of the moments where we actually can learn something. Alex Kashuta had this wonderful passage about deatomization. Maybe I can read it here in her most recent article. Um, maybe I can find it. I'd have to find it here. Um, uh, she says, atomization is a revealed preference because each individual instance we get atomized is measurably more comfortable. Every need, every urge has a tech-aided comfort and shortcut by way of supernormal stimuli. Digital forms of soma are everywhere, and any, any widget or screen is an all-singing, all-dancing amusement machine. Most food is hyper-palatable, ticket, and ticket to instant comfort, Pornography is oozing out of every pore of the internet and any combination of stacked genitalia you might enjoy is seconds away. Dissent is merely a rebellion against the state of affairs. And we have to actually be doing this. We have to actually be attempting these strategies or we're not actually doing politics. And just as pornography is oozing out of every pore on the internet, Opportunities for instant ideological satisfaction are also oozing out of every pore on the internet. We're trying to create an intellectual space where conversations actually do get resolved in a meaningful way. The proper product of the pagan and Christian conversation is an understanding between the two sides about where we differ and where our essential contentions are, such that a pagan doesn't need to be surprised when he hears the Christian arguments and vice versa. I'm not so sure exactly how that's going to go on collectively, given that oftentimes the pagan answers are so inconsistent. But if it turns out that paganism is just sort of a family of beliefs, then that just has to be the end of the conversation. It, it can't be pagan gang, because there is no pagan gang to speak of that has a consolidated position. There's just a variety of different individual perspectives that are critical of Christianity. I'm thinking of probably the most noble moment in, in all of this was the burial of Queen Elizabeth. This is the end of the 20th century properly. I think a lot of British people got a glimpse into what it would be like to live in a healthier world in that funeral. It, it really was more than, the, I think, the wedding, which had the weddings of William and then later Harry had this incredible paparazzi feel to them. So did the funeral of Princess Diana, who very famously had Elton John uh, play there or something like that. It felt really, it almost felt, it felt very 20th century, I'll say that. But because this was an actual royal funeral and a coronation on top uh, of, of a departure of a monarch, and a monarch who had been crowned in, in the 1950s, uh, it, couldn't, it, couldn't, it couldn't really be the media spectacle that Princess Diana's funeral was. And it, and it couldn't be the celebrity gossip feel-good wedding story that would feature in bridal magazines the way that Kate Middleton's wedding to uh, Prince William was. That, that couldn't be the case. It, what, it, what it marked was uh, the end of an era and, and the necessary realization of what England looked like when Queen Elizabeth was crowned and what it looked like when she passed, passed to her eternal reward. And I think that raises some interesting questions. I think that raises some questions that will be very, very challenging to people. Uh, but they have to be examined in a mode of truth and not in a mode of, of, of sort of vanity and not in a mode of entertainment either. I don't think there's a way to have this conversation in an entertaining way. But it's the conversation that we need to have. So that's a fairly truncated i started this this late this um this podcast late so it's a fairly truncated conversation this time i'll go on to answering super chats and um maybe i'll go on a little bit more about this i think i thought initially i was going to have sort of 
a bunch of slides to present, but I didn't have a chance to make them. And, um, you know, it's always <laughs> preparing for this stuff is always kind of a difficult thing. But um, I'll go on to the super chats and we can kind of go from there. I mean, really, I, I do kind of want to apologize for the pagan Christian fight. I, I think that this is something that just needs to be kind of resolved offline. But, but there also needs. To, I think. I think that under there's not. There's also not a symmetrical. There's no. There's no symmetry to this conversation, unfortunately. Um, what 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 the pig? Insofar as there's a pagan community, they need. This needs to be a conversation about theology and belief. This can't be a conversation, and this this is sort of where I, I do. I mean, this maybe this is just a line, right? Maybe this is a line. The same. Maybe all pagans want to do is, is talk about all. All they want to do is repeat like Nietzsche, Christianity is slave morality, repeat ridiculous notions that Christianity brought about the Dark Ages. And that the the period of Christianity in Europe was 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 a path of of total degeneration <laughs> that 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 I guess terminated when Europe became unchristian. I don't know. Correct me on my history, or or they might have, they might want to have more ridiculous conversations about about how Christianity is wrong because the Savior was from Israel or had a Hebrew background, or was from the line of David. Um, none of these conversations are, in, these are not mature conversations. These are not like valid intellectual points. These are not serious religious contentions. Uh, th these are like high school insults. Uh, the, the, uh, you know, they're, they're kind of like digs. Um, your religion is wrong because Jewish people touched it. It's not a serious contention that, that I need to entertain. I mean, you can make that something that you go on about in social media, uh, but I'm not going to answer it. I'm just going to dismiss it. And, and I should dismiss it because it's useless and it's stupid and it's really unworthy. So, um, yeah, I mean, there has to be progress in terms of that. There has to be progress in terms of the conversations we're having. I mean, as for the, the transgender stuff, I don't know really what conversation there needs to be, or the, or just basically the stuff having to do with with sex generally, and 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 how how we're actually going to manage sex and gender in the modern world. I mean, you really just have to establish what people's values are. I mean, do you want this culture to continue? Do you want the human race to continue? Do you want men and women to actually marry each other? A few weeks, actually just a, a few days ago, what am I talking about? Andrew Sullivan did this ridiculous interview with Louis, Louis Perry. I, and I could not believe me hearing this guy. So Andrew Sullivan was a person that, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I thought he was a serious person. Right? I, th I thought this was, like, this was a person, I, mean, I disagree with him, right? Initially, I, actually, I was actually a big follower of her, his back in my sort of new atheist days. I read his blog, The Daily Dish. He was, he was kind of cool. He was a rational advocate for marriage equality, which I supported at the time. And I thought, man, you know, it's really cool that Andrew Sullivan can marry his homosexuality with his Catholicism. You know, then later on, I, I sort of became orthodox, small or orthodox in my Catholic beliefs and kind of saw that this was ridiculous, marrying... Home, like a, a gay lifestyle with Catholicism, uh, and and yeah, you know, Andrew Sullivan became kind of a figure that was supremely wrong about marriage and equal, marriage equality or marriage uh, gay marriage. He was supremely wrong about gay marriage, and he was supremely misguided in, in his sexual preferences. But still, he was a serious figure. This week, a podcast comes out from Andrew Sullivan and. Um, you know, he's talking to Lewis Perry and her critiques on the sexual revolution. And Lewis Perry gets to talk about porn, uh, pornography. And Andrew Sullivan just starts, he starts sighing. <gasps> it's like, how could you say that men, you know, can't use pornography? Isn't, isn't that impossible? And he puts it like, like Sam Harris before, 
the, the way he speaks is sort of this, this very considered faculty lounge. He has a British accent, so it sounds really good, right? The sincere faculty lounge, I've considered all the positions mode. But what, what he's producing while he's speaking this way is absolutely positively drivel. By the end of the conversation, he's, he's basically telling Lewis Perry that it's impossible for, for a man not to stray in his marital vows, not in thought, which, you know, as guys, that happens, but in action, that it's impossible to ask men not to, you know, ha- develop affections for another wor- woman, and maybe the only way to preserve the marriage is to, you know, have an extramarital affair with the consent of the wife, or maybe the only way to save the marriage is to use pornography, and sort of the incredulity he applies to the idea that you could actually have a sexual urge and say no to it is amazing. The guy is in his 60s and he can't imagine someone saying no to a sexual urge. I mean, I he can't he can't get over pornography. I mean, I. I mean, I, I got over pornography in my late 20s when I converted to Catholicism uh, like in my late 20s, I mean, okay, you know, moments of weakness aside, you know, uh, properly confessed, you know, I have overcome this in, in, in a pretty real way. And, and he's telling me that it's impossible. And this is absolute drivel. I, I know heroic men who, who live an entire life of celibacy as monks and priests. And, and this public intellectual is going to tell me that no man can resist any urge that's put in front of him? This is absolutely insane. How how does anyone do anything in the society that, that's not just complete indulgence to, to their desires? I have no idea what this means. And so this isn't part of an adult conversation. This is just giving in to the spirit of the age and to our least healthy instincts. Is this Is this the only way that we can have interaction with with the rest of the world i don't think so uh, well i know it's not i know well, we can have friendships in the real world that don't operate on these insane rules uh, but but the only way to confront this insane conversation is to just walk away from it andrew sullivan's not a serious person he's, he's not a serious person not only because he has this view of sexuality that's bonkers and that is all-consuming and that trumps his religious perspective very obviously no religious principle he believes in will ever hold itself up to a sexual urge that he thinks is valid. And I don't know what, where the termination of that's supposed to be because there's sexual urges for very unsavory things, as I'm su- sure Mr. Sullivan is aware. Not only that, he doesn't take responsibility for his own pronouncements because a week before he had this horrible interview with Louis Perry, he was going on about how he, nev- he was a big advocate for the conservative case of gay marriage in which he promised, well, he implied that the institution of gay marriage would actually make gay relationships more like straight relationships, a.k.a. Cur- curb the promiscuity. Of course, there's no evidence for this. There's no evidence that promiscuity in the gay community has gone down. And, and the instance of monkeypox and the fact that there, there can be absolutely no pushback, again, on, 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 on sexual desires for any reason whatsoever after we've closed down churches for an entire year. Uh, the reaction to this is, oh, well, I never, you know, I never promised you a rose garden. I never said that gay marriage would have positive effects on, on, on the gay community. Oh, like what? <laughs> this is, I mean, first of all, I mean, it's, it almost feels kind of stupid to argue against this. I mean, you can, you can pull up the articles as Steve Saylor did, and highlight the relevant passages where, if he doesn't explicitly promise this, Sullivan impl- implies it very heavily. What, what was what was the argument supposed to be for gay marriage? Just give gay, gays gay marriage because they want it, because it will have a completely negative impact on heterosexuality, because norms established for gay men in the form of things like Grindr are going to carry over to app-based dating in the forms of Tinder. This is just, this is an insane conversation for people who aren't adults. And it's, it's one that we kind of have to get past. We have to kind of just ignore these people and 
and, and try to find some more productive way to get on with our lives and talk, speak to things that are more meaningful. But with that, I think I'm going to get to the super chats. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the, the trilemma as, as we get more material. So uh, the first super chat, this should appear. Okay, the first super chat or the first entropy chat is from Morgan Allen for $20 USA. Any thoughts on Peter Zahan? I've noticed reactionary vloggers are up to speed regarding the impending food and energy crisis. But if you look past his neoliberal politics, I think he has some additional insights into geopolitics, the Ukraine war, deglobalization, fertility collapse, and the NRX sphere could learn from him. Well, I am kind of aware of Peter Zihan as a commentator, but I always thought he was kind of more of, um, you know, the, the, one of the mainstream crowd, like the neoliberal people. I mean, presumably he's aware of the energy and f food crisis that's looming over all of us. And uh, I, I talked about this a lot with the Franklins. So I'm not so sure what really there is to reiterate now, but this is... This is something that I don't know. I mean, I'd have to know what a new take is on this whole thing. I know Charlemagne and um, he did an article on, I mean, he's in a lot of really good articles. So absolutely subscribe to Charlemagne's Substack. He, he's a friend. But I, I have to say that I, I haven't really been too interested on, on sort of um, trying to predict who will win the Russia-Ukraine war. I think this is sort of an imponderable and because the information we're getting is bad. Uh, there's the fog of war. And so you can speak in broad terms, like it's very difficult to imagine Russia losing without a more direct Western intervention. And, and you, can, you can speak in broad terms, like the Russian army has just performed horribly uh, over the first eight months of this war. But, but talking about moving fronts, I don't think that's really an exercise that we can do properly. And so I'm not so sure if I really believe anyone who tells me they know the ultimate fate of this. I, I certainly know what the consequence is going to be on global energy and food markets, which is going to be it's absolutely going to you know, tank them. I, I would, I, 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 and it's all, it's all going to kick in. I mean, it, this is really obvious. The shit's going to hit the fan in November. Because in the, the, the Democrats are juicing the economy with, with the, the strategic petroleum re reserves. We're draining it. We're trying, to, we're trying to hold back necessary increases in the interest rates. I think that's another thing that's going to happen, that, that's in the works. I think that there are probably other levers of the economy that they're, they're trying to hold back until after the election. And they know they can't hold them forever. But when November comes... The other foot's going to drop and the gas prices are going to go up and inflation is going to skyrocket. And that's going to coincide with the, the, in, the incidence of winter and the energy crisis that's going to hit Europe. And I don't know what's going to happen after this November, but we're, we're going to we're, we're going to see. Right. And, and it's, just, it's an imponderable. Right. I, I'd love to talk to people. I'd like to ply them with questions. But the Franklin, who's someone who I know is like pretty. He's pretty knowledgeable on all of this stuff. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm sorry about that. Um <laughs> So yeah, it's there's going to be crying in the background for the foreseeable future of these things go on for two hours, but the Franklin, who is somebody who I consider to be, uh, you know, he, he's very knowledgeable about this stuff, and he, he talks to a lot of people. I, you know, we compare notes on our attitudes towards the food and energy crisis in the Ukraine war, and it's pretty much the same observations that everyone has. Uh, I don't know what, what other insight you could really get. And so, and I don't believe uh, the stuff that comes out of mainstream sources. I, I'd love to talk to this person, but um, you'd have to be more particular about what you think we could, we could really learn from a more mainstream commenter on this topic. What is your opinion on building communities? So this is John Buckley for $10 USA. I'm going to get a drink here. So he says, what is your opinion 
on building communities around monasteries. I know there are 100 Orthodox monasteries in the U.S., ranging from city to suburbs to country. Couldn't a monastery act as a central hub of faith, learning, and community and technology? Uh, well, yes, it could. And uh, where I used to live in you know, Portland, Oregon, there's a nearby monastery community called Mount Angel. I'm not so sure how thriving the Catholic communities around, around that area are. But although, although building your community around monasteries, I think, is a good idea, and, and it, it's certainly something that I think, if you're, really, if, if you're in a, a mode where you can just move anywhere, that's something to definitely consider, is, is all moving around a monastery. Uh, but a lot of people can't do that. Uh, a lot of people in the positions that I'm in have, have jobs that keep them locked down to certain territories, uh, at least for the time being, until we can uh, solve some financial problems. And we have, um, we have, a, we have broader, we, we, it's also, there's also not enough monasteries. I think that's another problem too. And monasteries, you know, it, it's, it's interesting. You, you, you can't think of them as kind of like community hubs, but really monks main, goal in life is not to sort of be facilitators of Christian social life for secular people. It, it is actually uh, to, to sing the offices of prayers throughout the hours and, and to live a life of contemplation. Uh, so really, the, the monk's own role in this is, is kind of limited. And, and oftentimes, these monastery communities can, can develop tourist communities around them as well, which is kind of like detracts from, from the, the tight-knit community dimension of it as well. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I think I think it's a, a interesting concept to explore, but the more important dimension of of our, our project seems to be just to get local communities built up around major population centers that 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 are reasonable at helping people live Christian lives without them journeying off to the hinterlands to be one uh, to be around one of the few Orthodox monasteries. Uh, another issue too is that if it's a monastery where you have cloistered monks, it's going to be in an isolated area, which means that the housing price is going to be well. It's either going to be really, really isolated, in which case you've got logistic problems, you know, dealing with schools and stuff like that, and and obviously with work, or it's going to be in a not so isolated, isolated area, in which case the housing prices prices are going to be atrociously high. So that's something to consider as well. So a lot of logistic problems, but I know that there are people who've made this work. So I'll say it's a good idea, certainly not for everyone. Um, Mim the Dwarf for $3. Thank you for recommending The Elephant Man. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful film. I hope to attain even a fraction of the virtue displayed by individuals such as Merrick and Dr. Trees before I depart this world. That's the most any of us can hope for you know when when you get to be my age and i'm not young but i'm not old i'm not old but i'm not young i should say you know it's um you you get to kind of you, you get to kind of view the limitations on your own achievement very concretely you can see the things that you're not going to do and the things that you might do and because of that, you have to regard your own mortality with a certain amount of practicality. And part of this is the fact that you're going to be a disappointment to yourself in some real way. You're not going to be a, a big person or whatnot. And this is this is very true with its own channel and what I'm trying to do here too. When I talk to people on this podcast, I, I really want to be talking to a group of equals and a group of friends. And I don't like this idea of... Uh, I mean, the hierarchy has its appropriate places, but, but not in an intellectual venue. In an intellectual venue, only the ideas should be important. And only, I mean, you can tell me I'm wrong. I might be right. I might give insight. I might be way off base. I might have a good podcast or a bad one. And that's fine. But, but there shouldn't be this, the idea of clout and prestige and, and making a big splash. That can't really be part of it. And, and I know some of us probably are going to be able to go professional. And I'm not going to be one of them. Aaron McIntyre probably can may, may be able to do this professionally. Tim Pool certainly can, although he's not really in our sphere. Uh, and 
I can't be jealous of that. I have to just, I have to treat my life and my limitations philosophically. Of course, the demons that whisper in my ear always try to make me envious of people who, who, who are able to do their passion project as their job. But really, you have to be philosophical about this entire endeavor. I have the time that I have. I have the intellectual limitations that I have. I have the trade-off between family and career and finances that I have. And we just have to hope that we... I mean, maybe I'll die tomorrow, right? Maybe, maybe I'll get horribly sick tomorrow. Uh, and then, you know, my life will just be the contributions that, that were. And I pray to God that there is something of wisdom that's in, in all of the stuff I've produced. Uh, but there may not be. I, I could be horribly off base in a lot of ways. And it's, it's, it's amazing to see a life like John Merrick's who, I mean, I, I don't think he, I don't think he was, he was a, a divine soul, but he didn't, he, he wasn't like Ramajan. He didn't like invent all these theorems or write a book. There is a book that the Elephant Man is based on, but it's written by the surgeon. And um, the, the, but, but at the same time, he had this indelible mark of grace, I think. And sometimes that's enough. If anybody can have, I, I really do think that it, just a few moments of grace, of real grace in one's life, can make an entire human existence worthwhile, on balance better. I, I think that doesn't merely make sense from a material point of view, but I, 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 I do believe that. And, and it's something worth considering. It's also something worth considering where we're really, the dissident rightness needs to slow the conversation down radically. It, it really does. I was listening to Alex Kashuda today talk uh, about NatCon conference and all these crazy ideas being thrown around. It's still early days, guys. People are just discovering that the old world is dead. They're just discovering the old world is dead. A lot of people caught on early. A lot of people caught on in, in when the financial crisis hit. A lot more people caught on in the Great Awakening or later with Gamergate. A lot of people caught on when Trump was elected or just at the beginning of COVID. But now we're saying that the old world just is not going to come back. And we need people to actually take in this world and describe it honestly. We don't need people to dunk on each other. I don't think that that can... We, we, I think we need to definitively say that some ideas are just bad. Some modes of conversation are bad. Some ways of having conversations are certainly bad. But, but I don't think that we, we're in a position where, where, we're, where we're just trying to debunk things. What we're trying to do is we're trying to slow the conversation down and figure out what, is, what our actual priorities are. And I think once the priorities are in place, things will be a lot clearer. Certainly the priority right now for all of us in our personal lives is getting through the next eight months, getting through summer of getting to summer of 2023 as financially intact as possible and as deatomized as possible, as healthy as possible. And, and with our own personal clarity, we've developed in the meanwhile intact with our minds not enslaved to some appealing ideology or, or blackmailed in fear to, to not allow ourselves to be paranoid. Oh, I was wrong about something. That means that I can't think for myself anymore. Oh, I was on the wrong side of this issue. Therefore, I have to participate in a lie so I can feel less guilty about myself. You know, we, we have to, that's our objective right now. And in its early days, and because of that, we benefit from having a conversation that goes slower, that, that can be kind of felt, felt out intuitively and, and kind of experience. It, it heartens me to see so many people starting to raise families. And I think it's no secret that, in particular, a lot of the good female content creators all are married and have children. That dimension to your life is a groundedness and academic agents absolutely right when, when you have children a certain amount of your ability to be heroic and you know for instance like this guy just said about moving to a monastery i can't do that because i've got too many roots down and too many 
financial obligations that I'm trying to regulate right now. But if you're in your 20s, you can move to wherever you want to. You don't, you're not tied down yet. Heroic action is yours for the taking. Uh, you can more perfectly reflect dissent. I would simply ask that while you dissent, you know, don't separate yourself from society. No, don't don't atomize, and 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 don't reattach yourself to unhealthy habits. Uh, d don't don't use your radical energy to spurg out online. Uh, use it in a more productive way. You've got time to actually explore books and ideas, or or if you're in a more productive sense, to create art. And and I think that that's really and listen to people who are older in this in this regard too. I mean. What, so what, what they what the classic adage said is certainly true uh, that it, youth is wasted on the young if the youth had but wisdom if the old had but time what a world would we live in and, and one of the real problems about being atomized in, in the way that we are is that people can't impart wisdom to young people and so much of the wisdom we get from the baby boom generation like what's coming out of Andrew Sullivan's mouth is just warmed over a cope. It's just lies he's telling to himself to justify his own poor decisions and his own apostasy. And there's no, there's no truth behind that. There's no wisdom behind that at all. Okay, great. Well, thank you. I'm going to move on from that. Oh, I should mention, though, about NACON Squad. Um, Yoram Hazoni. I need to write an essay on Yoram Hazoni, but I can't. Because I can't talk about Yoram Hazoni without talking about the community he comes from and my opinions, both positive and negative, on, on that community. And I can't talk about that community and still not be banned on YouTube. No, I actually don't even have anything spicy to say about Yoram. I really, really like the guy. I actually, he really appeals to me. He's not part of my community, either ethnically or religiously. But I, I do have one problem. I, I, I'm mentioning Yoram Harzoni because he was called out by Alex Kashuda. And uh, I, I always think of um, I always think of that Aesop's whenever I see Yoram Harzoni talk, he always launches he's an Orthodox um, an Orthodox Jew. And very frequently in his delivery, he launches into this wisdom he thinks he's imparting to young people. And he gives a lecture very much like I just gave you, right? Uh, about like, you know, we need to shape up and, you know, de-atomize and detach and all this stuff, right? Um, but it, it's, it's horribly frustrating for me to listen to this because he sort of presupposes that, that like, there's this, there's this religious community ready to receive us. He, he's not aware that the Jewish community in particular has for hundreds of years developed an ability to survive as a diaspora community without the support of larger organizations. Uh, they've built networks, and more importantly than that, they've built kind of rules of thumb where the secular side, uh, they definitely criticize the Orthodox, but, the, but it's kind of toned down a little bit. Uh, they don't really go, they don't really chimp out on each other. And so it doesn't completely turn into a circular fire squad. And because of that, it, it, it's much easier to enter into community and, and to have these separatist communities for that particular religion. And they've been much more successful in doing that. When Yoram Harzoni gives this advice to Christians, the only thing I can think about is that Aesop's fable with the fox and the stork. And the fox... Uh, cruelly decides to invite the stork over for dinner and he serves he serves the, the, the dinner in these plates on the floor and the stork can't get down to the plate because she's too far up on, on her tall legs. And then the stork invites the fox over to her house and, and she serves the, the meal in this giant vase or vase, depending on what your country you're from. And, and, and she's able to drink it with her long bill and the fox can't eat it and he can only smell it and get really jealous. It, it feels like his advice is being given to a community who just can't receive it. The, the biggest problem 
Christians have right now is that our community is smashed. Uh, there are intact Christian communities, but the problem is is that they can't. Their leadership of these Christian communities has been totally cowed, uh, either into a hard form of dissent, or or to just kind of going along with the mainstream opinion, or of just or just shutting up altogether. And because of that, the sort of radical energy that a lot of young people hope to encounter in, in more conservative religious communities, it's not available to everyone. It's really, really hard to find a based religious group. So, so when we, we on the distant right talk about this stuff, in order to be properly useful to people, we have to acknowledge that barrier as opposed to just kind of like hand wave it with like platitudes like, oh, well, join a church. Go to church and get married and stop making internet arguments. I mean, for a lot of people, the internet is all they have at this moment. And, and we have to give people ways to build outside of this, you know? And that's a process. Um, okay, so moving on to the next super chat. Uh, Mark Yagon for $5. Hi, Dave. I hate to... I hate the expert-based... Hi, Dave. I hate the expert-based consensus. All my homies hate the expert-based consensus. But what should the right replace it with? Um, well, the right cannot... This is one of the things. The right cannot replace an expert consensus with another expert consensus. This is the problem we get into. And it's one of the reasons why we spurg out on, on these sort of things like paganism versus Christianity. Uh, if this were 2005 or, you know, and you were a progressive, you just go to the universities and get the, the best practices uh, for, for whatever you want. Maybe even the best practices for religion, which in, in the event of 2005, the expert consensus is that religion is bunk and you should be a new atheist or whatever, right? That's, that's what all the evolutionary biologists would say. And, and they're studying memes now, don't you know? So they're experts on this, right? Um, this is never going to be the case for the distant right in our lifetime. There are going to be a variety of different communities that are politically allied and that are trying to seek their own way in, in, the, in the very, very slow motion collapse uh, of, of the Western world order. And I mean very slow motion. The best thing we can do intellectually at a large level is to create an intellectual space where ideas are exchanged with, exchanged with certain rules and regulations. Uh, we can we can we can establish things that we should that are productive and not productive to have happen, or or to say or to do. Uh, we can develop best practices for discourse, but we're not going to develop an expert consensus that that can rival it. The one thing that that is true is this is the thing. The expert consensus is going to be continuously wrong. Increasingly wrong. The Atlantic Monthly, which is one of the premier cathedral mouse, mouthpieces, one of the premier fixtures of the elite mainstream, published an article three days ago arguing that there should be no sex differentiation within sports. Uh, this is absolute bunk. Everyone can see it's bunk. And this needs to be the beginning of a conversation with people. I don't know exactly what that conversation looks like. It certainly can't go on with the likes of Andrew Sullivan because they're in the process of total ideological cope. But what we're, what we're offering, what, what all, our alternative community is offering, is just plainly spoken truths about the world. Not elaborate theories... Not, oh, I'm the person here that's going to be on the line for every mistake that a Republican governor or a Republican president or a conservative Supreme Court makes. Or I'm on line for fixing poverty or fixing the decrepit state of our sexual marketplace. The only thing that we're saying is we can speak honestly about the truth as it is. And we're, li we're living more healthy lives than the alternative. We're living more real lives than the alternative is. And if you want to be part of a community of healthy people that can actually talk about the truth, then then come join the discussion here because it's certainly not going on in the mainstream. For tightly guarded truths like COVID, this is difficult. The, the holy grail for COVID, and this is where I disagree with people like Morgoth, 
it's not one like it's not whether you know it's not on the effectiveness of masks or drugs it's not on necessarily the ultimate origin of covid or the effectiveness of lockdowns or on this policy or that or even the double standard on monkeypox the the, the 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 holy grail for COVID is how many things, how many facts can we collect that are just definitively proven to be false at the end of it? Like the 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 establishment said one thing, banned people for saying the opposite, and then turned out to be completely wrong, and there were horrible consequences for them being wrong. How many of those things can we put together at this time? And this has been a challenge. Obviously, the bad policy with regard to the closure of schools, I believe, is one of these things. I think the studies coming out showing the harms of this are definitive. And, and the fact that there was likely to be a very, very minimal effect on exposing young children to this disease is just complements the fact that this was a horrible policy decision. The, the stuff like the effectiveness of certain drugs and the origin of COVID the cathedral, the establishment is going to do everything in its power to muddy the water on these topics. I, I myself am not convinced about where this thing ultimately comes from or, or, or the effectiveness of the countermeasures we've taken to it. But I know for sure that the establishment does not want to learn the truth about this. They want to take the truth. They want to bury it in a bunch of noise and then shove the data in a time capsule and revisit it in 35 years or 45 years when this is all blown over. The, the risk of being wrong on one of these major issues is just too large. But we have to be waiting open jawed for, for anything we can put together because what, what we want to do with the expert consensus people is to point out continuously how the expert consensus is betraying them. Right now, the expert consensus through the Atlantic Monthly is asking for us to completely abolish women's sports at a fundamental level. That's the reality of it. And that reality can be brought to people. And, you know, if, if they want to be part of the expert consensus, like they can own that. And, and you know, yeah, I, I am making them owners of the expert consensus insofar as they want to censor people or censure people, punish people for holding dissident views. And at the point where you acknowledge that the dissident views are needed, need to be aired, well, I mean, welcome to our community because you're one of the thought criminals now. And there's there's no reason to go halfway in this. It, is, is, is the establishment going to cut you some slack? I don't think so. And maybe it will because it has to. But that just, that just delays the ultimate question about why it continuously goes in and continuously advocates for absolute absurdities and, and, and pushes forward policies that hurt us. Society Man for $10. Um, with, impending, with impending hyperinflation, energy, and food shortages, the priority for many will soon be just survival. The atomization the cathedral strives for will be incompatible with such a world. Our leaders are unable to roll anything back and will press harder until the people or the system break. Yeah, society, man, I don't know what's going to happen. I, I really don't because we're so atomized at this point that I don't know what the alternative system is necessarily that, that can actually develop under, underneath this all. I think it's going to be local governments lo, lo, like or state government gover governments that put things together. I think it's going to be, if we go through a real period of hardship in this country, the first thing that has to die is, is people like trying to, you know, isolate you for misuse of things like pronouns and gender. The woke policing of speech just has to end. It has to, I, I, obviously this is law in a lot of regards, so it can't, it can't completely go away. But it has to not be respected in a real way. I don't know how to break this down. Right now, it feels like all of the people who are based and have families and who are professionals are just keeping their heads down and trying to ignore this stuff. 
And the only people who are really feel comfortable speaking thought crime are people who have nothing to lose and who are, who are far away from being competent themselves and don't have their own lives in order. And, you know, the, the people who, who, are, who have their lives in order need to get a lot more brave. And the people who, who, who are speaking thought crime have to get a lot more strong. It's awkward society, man, because our society is about to take a big hit. And I'm not so sure what, I'm not so sure what's really going to happen. We we've in the last year and a half we've undergone we've undergone an enormous amount of learned helplessness, and I'm not so sure how that's undone anytime soon. Uh, I guess we're going to have to unlearn a lot of helplessness in the next six months, but we'll have to revisit this in in the summer of 20, uh, uh, in the summer of 2023. Um, okay, so Tildo Yaggins says ad fad. I don't know what that means. Ad fab. It sounds like the British TV show ad fab. <laughs> um, what is it? Uh, always defect, always, I don't know. <laughs> ad fad. Is that an acronym for something? I, I was going to say, like, could it be the Alec Baldwin thing? Always be closing. Or some uh, attention, attention, decision. What is it? Attention, decision. Uh, which like attention, interest, decision, action. <laughs> that, that's the one. You know, it's something like that. Maybe, maybe it's an acronym. But I can't decipher that with only four letters. So you're going to have to help me out here or something. And I'm not trying to ply you from our super chats. I'm just saying. I have a little too low on sleep to kind of uh, reconstruct an acronym on the fly. The Dashing Rogue for $3 USA. Paganism is a, jo is a joke. They are a product of modernity born of the 60s, 70s, and 80s. The New Age drug culture are all products of modernity. Okay, here's where I want to stop you. I kind of agree with you. The paganism I grew up with in Northern California is certainly a joke that's a product of the 60s and 70s drug culture. And like warmed over feminism claptrap, but like, but there are a lot of considered pagans in our circles that that are experiencing something that I think is devout. And you know, like throwing a jab at them, and it, that's not going to resolve this question. And, and also, the, another thing that's not going to resolve this question again, like I said, is to is to find even content creators like. They, they 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 come they, they they come in for a debate and their their ideas are sort of undercooked they're not as strong as they could be uh like this don't have a debate with them in public until the steel man shows up because if you just slam somebody down like it, it does it does make very good like entertainment for youtube it does and i kind of enjoy it um but I, I don't really have any interest in doing that among fellow right-wingers because any embarrassment they feel is actually a problem for me further down the line because it makes the, the other pagans less likely to come to the table to have the actual important conversation about, about theology and about belief and about what they're experiencing and, and what they want to see in a spirituality going forward. I mean, certainly... What I, I mean, what the questions I want to ask to the pagans, you know, first of all, I want them to get, I mean, I want them to tell me what they actually believe. And, and I want to actually press on that a little bit with, with sort of the classic syllogisms that Christians have always asked to pagans that I think they included in my essay. I want to understand what their practice is, but, but I also want to see how we can explore boundaries here. And they have to be boundaries of respect. I... It's obvious that pagans can respect Christianity. I mean, this this is something Christians can respect paganism to a degree. We can respect it as a rival religion. We cannot make assertions like, you know, uh, we all believe in the same thing really underneath the hood. We we can't say that. Uh, we can't associate God with with like Odin, or or Jesus with Odin. We we can't do that. Uh, but we can have a mutual standing respect with that community and, and not throw lobos at each other. Um, but, but, but 
pagans can't just be like, oh, well, we're not going to define our religious views. Let's let's talk about how y- your religion is Jewish and you know your your all adherence to slave morality. That's not like that's not a serious. That's that's a low blow. That's like the equivalent. Uh, for instance, two sports teams can respect each other, even though they have to play against each other. And the solution is just to have everyone leave it on the field. Uh, starting a big knife fight, calling the other team like pussies, is just, that's not, that doesn't do anything except decrease the sportsmanship that's going to be on display where it, where it really matters. The conversation we have is a conversation over theology and it has to begin and end there. And it has to begin with what they're actually feeling and it has to begin with what, what respect can you give Christians? What respect can pagans give Christians? Do they have boundaries? I mean, certainly, I mean, they have 2,000 years or like 1,500 years at least of Christian ancestors. If ancestor worship is a thing, those ancestors have to be respected in some regards. So if a future peoples practiced religion that looked like Christianity, how much of a problem would they actually have with it? And what would the boundaries to discourse be in that kind of conversation? that's the only kind of conversation I'm willing to have. Uh, and, you know, not, not slam dunks on this stuff. You know, I don't, I don't want to call them LARPers, uh, but, you know, the, the community, the, there has to be theology there for me not to. You know, that there has to be a theological discussion that develops in order for that concern to be fully put to bed. I mean, again, I, I want to put to bed that concern by strengthening their position and making it more clear. Tildo Yaggins for $5 USA. As an occultist who has genuine spiritual experience, I find the lack of spiritual substance in modern Christianity and its followers to be one of its main factors of dissuading people from joining. You said this yourself and your lack of spiritual experiences. Well, I mean, that's not true. Spiritual substance and spiritual experience are not the same thing. Like, it's just, it's not, this is a confusion here, and this is a confusion that I think occultists encourage. Uh, First of all, you know, uh, note on mysticism here. So, proper religions are very, very careful with how they promote things like occultism and mysticism. When you deal with spirituality and mass spirituality, like, and this is true for paganism, it's true for, just as it's true for Christianity, it's true for Islam and Judaism, they all have mystical traditions that make, that that put, uh, that, and, and mystical traditions always put this focus on this like mystical experience you have with the divine. Think of like, St. Teresa of Avalon's cascading, uh, St. Teresa of Avalon's cascade, like interior castle, or, or what you see in sort of Jewish Kabbalah or something like that. Um, real religions are very careful with how they handle the occult. And, and certainly nobody would conflate spiritual experience with spiritual substance. And I think if you don't under, I, I really, I want to draw a line here that needs to be a big understanding because it, it can't be like paganism can't be like, let's go practice witchcraft or let's drop peyote or, you know, let's let, this, this stuff needs to be handled with a certain amount of care. And because what like the pagans hated witches, there was a huge, for instance, there was a huge witch trial in Rome of all places over the death of Germanicus the same year, I think, that Jesus died. Or I think, oh, actually, it was about 10 years before uh, Jesus was crucified. Uh, this this is a concern everywhere because occultic practice is incredibly dangerous because it can be used to deceive and dissuade people from moral action just as easily as it can be to reveal something that's real about spirituality. And so all real religions that have had a mystic perspective have always been very, very careful with telling people, don't, you know, seek out spiritual experience if you feel cold to it and, 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 and take stock of it when it occurs to you organically. But, but don't force it. 
and certainly don't give spiritual experience priority over wisdom and priority over the ethical obligations that are put upon you. I really devoutly believe that. And, and for that reason, occultism and mysticism are dangerous. I mean, occult, occultism sounds like it's, it's, it's heading in the direction of like straight up sorcery and stuff like that. And, and any kind of, any kind of spirituality that is derived from a mode of will and not a mode of supplication has to be treated with an extreme amount of suspicion. Uh, whether it's pagan or Christian or Jewish or Islamic, this is this, this is just not a proper way to deal with the spiritual. You should always be receiving from the spiritual, not commanding or bargaining with. That's not something you should ever do. And and I say that this this is the wisdom of people who are far more wise than myself, who, who also say that the person who does not have a spiritual experience is to, is to no disadvantage to the person who does when they come to being morally upstanding. For myself to seek out spiritual experiences by like doing, remember everyone in college like we did salvia or took mushrooms. They tried like bring on like the spiritual revelations and, and get, I mean, it's all bullshit. It, it leads you, it doesn't, the people who did that didn't seem to come to any greater wisdom in my experience. And, and even if you come from a tradition where you can use those kind of things to procure a spiritual experience, um, it can't be unbounded because I think it just leads to really bad and degenerate places. And this is not something that I just say. It's something that most most spiritual masters have pointed to this problem as well. So I uh, thank you, though. But yeah, be very careful of, of mysticism, and especially when it tends towards the occult. It's not something that should be undergone lightly. It will lead you astray, I think, unless you're very careful with it. John Buckley for ten dollars USA. What's your opinion on building community? What didn't I just answer this one? Um, okay, I just John Buckley. I just answered this question before about uh, communities. I don't know if you re-ask if you re-ask something you super chatted. Uh, if you have another question, at reply me, and I'll try to see your reply at the end of the stream and a answer a different question so you can get your money's worth. Uh, but that being said, to avoid boring the audience, I'm going to go on to the next question, which is Nerve AMV Maker. Um, it's cringe how normie cons are saying that the backlash towards the Rings of Power and the new Little Mermaid have nothing to do with the Rays spending. When this is the entire origin of the black, when this is the entire origin of the backlash. They, were, they refuse to admit that people have a right to be insulated uh, by such, uh, oh, sorry, a right to be insulted, I think. I think you said insulated, but I think people have a right to be insulted by such a casting. Um, yeah, people do have a right to be insulted by, by a race-neutral casting. You have a right, I think, to an accurate representation of, I mean, you have a right to it. I mean, it can, it can be done taste, I think race- Bending can be done tastefully, it but it but it has to be done sparingly, and it has to be done in such an, in a non ideological way. This is obviously being driven by ideology, and when it comes to something like Hans Christian Andersen or Tolkien, these things are so deeply located in a particular ethnicity that that the race bending as an aesthetic choice means that you're pulling thematically in the opposite direction that the artist himself was trying to uh you're pulling in the opposite direction that the artist was pulling when he created the initial work hans christian anderson's story of the little mermaid was was actually a quite devout story of 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 um of dedication and love and self-sacrifice and, and the moral that it tries to teach at the end is that uh, the lure of romanticism is a trap and the the real love is an act of self-giving. And, and and through the act of self-giving, the Little Mermaid's able to transcend her her sort of base material existence that, that she has as an elemental creature. That's the crux of it. It's it's deeply Christian. And it's also deeply located in, in in Denmark, which is why you have the 
uh, the statue of the, the Little Mermaid very famously there. To, to race spin that is, is to kind of is to kind of twist that core dimension of it. And and I know the, the obvious rejoinder is well the original Disney's Little Mermaid also uh, bends the. <laughs> they they completely remove the Christian theme from from the product. Yeah, that's absolutely the case. Um, this is uh, this is something that it's um, it, you're you're being lured into a trap with this, right? You're being lured into a trap like this because they know that the baby boomers did not properly guard the heritage that should be your birthright. And they've partially given it away. And, and what they're trying to, the, the, the trap they're trying to catch you in, and the trap that the Normicons have fallen into, is that they're trying to, they're trying to, they're trying to get you to say, oh, well, all of this partially compromised culture that I remember from my childhood, it, you know, the, the, the kind of deracinated rebellion that you see in Star Wars, or the romanticized version of the Little Mermaid that misses the entire po point of the original Little Mermaid, or you know, or or Frozen, which turns the the Hans Christian Andersen allegory of, over over spiritual renewal and, and and rejection of atheism into into uh, into a uh, an allegory of feminism. Like they're they're trying to get you to to bite down and own these partially paused material the partially poison material and then what they're trying to do is they're trying to get you to pull out at the last moment and, and go oh wow why, why are you doing that are you a racist are you a racist oh my god and then they're trying to shame you into going the whole way with them and then just to give up emotionally on taking any ownership over this stuff the 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 so what's the right reaction well the right reaction is to completely reject the frame uh, is this to go, okay, well, I, first of all, I don't give a shit about the Amazon remake of Lord of the Rings or The Little Mermaid. Uh, they can, it, it's, it looks pretty bad. And yes, one of the reasons why it's bad is, is, is that it has, it, it's, 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 it's race swapped. It's also because of bad writing. And, uh, but, but, but I, I understand that this is a process of, of deracination that that started basically since the beginning of the 20th century and that's now cresting and and sure you know maybe i like the old little mermaid maybe i like the original star wars maybe i like these sanitized cultural products that were sold to me in a previous age but but i understand them as flawed creations because of the deracination that they experienced at the hand of companies like disney and I, I see no reason that I should have to participate in its continuation. And that's your sincere position, right? And sure, the race is one more straw on the camel's back. It obscures a key particular component to, to the Little Mermaid and to the Lord of the Rings. Uh, you, you can't have uh, a supremely Danish creation without having its Europeanness be primary. Just as you cannot really have uh, an understanding of the royal family without the royal family's Britishness being primary. And I, I say that with full knowledge that the British royal family is German. <laughs> but still, it, that component of it, it, it's link to the actual people and to the actual land. Those are all details that cannot be removed from the product without destroying it. But, but in the entire conversation... If you're not rejecting the entirety of the project of deracination, if you're trying to pull an Andrew Sullivan, and, or if you're trying to pull a, a deracinated American dipshit thing, or where you try to justify the consumer product's previous uh, sins as, as somehow something that's so good that, that, that it can be autonomous and define your ident identity while, while trying to you know, do, do down this latest iteration, your rejection has to be more total for it to be believable, and that's why the normie cons are failing. Cringe Walker for five dollars USA. I've noticed suddenly the British care about their identity again, and I can't help but f uh, I don't think that appear on the screen, did it? Okay, um, I've noticed suddenly that the British care about their identity again, 
and I can't help but feel a subtle patriarchy of having a I can't I can't help but feel the subtle patriarchy of having a king you call lord rather than a mum who has some subconscious nudge to it. So you think that yeah, I think that's actually true. I think that the the presence of uh, an actual king on the throne of England puts in mind of all British people the idea that this is an actual executor and, and not simply uh, a focal point of our adoration uh, as are most female monarchs. I am trying to get a Substack essay out about this very topic, but it's obviously slow going because I have a lot of other work. And um, yeah, uh, yeah, that's absolutely true. I think... We'll see how long this lasts. I'm hoping that, well, who who knows, right? Because I'm, you're you're always hoping of a nucleus of British people that understand themselves as British or English people, but that's so dis, that's so discouraged by the mainstay of British culture that always has a difficult time materializing in any real way. So so we'll see what what actually comes of it. Uh, okay, so Scotty McDumpwaffle. Dave, I challenge you in the name of the Dark Gods. Please, my wife is threatening to sell them if I don't play a game. Uh, I challenge you in the name of the Dark Gods. Please, my wife is threatening to sell them if I don't play a game. Are you challenging me to a game of Warhammer? <laughs> well, uh, I don't know. I just pop on down the next time you're in my state. I don't know what to say. Uh, the game can't be played uh, digitally. Are, are you asking me for my long-awaited 40K live stream where I, uh, where I, uh, uh, I, I discuss the ins and outs of everyone's favorite grim, dark, right-wing fantasy of, of a future that, that, that is uh, turbo-gothic? How else can I interpret this? Uh... I'm chall I challenge you in the name of the dark gods. My wife is threatening to sell them if I don't play a game. Well, I, I shudder to think about what your wife is threatening to sell if it is not your your game pieces. So I will um I will I will politely decline to speculate further on that question, but hey, you know. If I can pencil you in, maybe I, you know, don't have a ton of spare time these days, but, but I like to think that I'm up for anything. Um, quick cringe Walker for three dollars USA. My usual response to the Smedic Cooties argument is to request they post a physique. In all, nearly all instances, this stops the argument. Oh, so you're saying you want their twenty-three and me results or their. Uh, you know, they're they're them, them flexing when they're doing the repetitions or some some muscle muscle shots. Um, yeah, yeah, the the the, the Semitic cooties thing. It just I I appreciate that the kind of rejoinder, but um, yeah, the Semitic cooties thing is just not. This is not this is not an argument that adults make for for religion. It's it's stupid. I I never heard anyone tell me with a straight face that this isn't stupid. And and so is like the you know the slave morality thing I, again like you know I'll put it this way guys you know if you're a if you're a pagan here uh, for, in, in in case you're 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 um in in case you're inclined to to make the ten thousand ten thousandth post about you know Semitic cooties or or uh, uh, or, or slave morality. Uh, I, I I knew a lot of people who were into paganism in the whole Ren scene fair, and these people were the most degenerate feminist people imaginable, who were all in like these horrible poly relations relationships where like everyone was sleeping with everyone else, and it was just an utter dramatic mess. And they still use this language. Like you could hear a guy talk, a, a, a pagan guy would would earnestly tell you about how Christianity was slave morality, and, and not authentically European, oh, while while his his wife was off sleeping with somebody else. 
<laughs> it's like, great dude. If, 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 if this is, if this is master morality, then, you know, gee, I wonder if the slaves have got something right for a change. You know, I mean, this is, this is, these are not serious arguments. Anybody can make them and they communicate absolutely nothing. Okay, so Rasmus Jansen for $10. While I'm not pagan, I do think there is validity to the idea that modern mechanical materialism is a byproduct of Christianity, or at least the collapse of it. Keith Woods' most recent video titled The Roots of Our Environmental Crisis provides a good summation of the argument. Your thoughts? Well, I haven't seen that Keith Woods video. I've seen a lot of other ones where he takes materialism to task, and they all have been really good. In fact, that's one of Keith Woods' best... His best videos are taking modern materialism to task. Because this, you know, it, it is absolute bunk. Um, but why is that a byproduct of Christianity? I mean, it's certainly the byproduct of its collapse, right? I, I don't understand this at all. And uh, maybe I, I need to familiarize myself with the art. This is actually a mature argument. This is actually interesting. Uh, all of these modern materialist movements come from the Enlightenment, and, and they only really kick into gear in the late 19th century with the collapse of religious practice carrying over to the total collapse of religious practice in the 20th century. Uh, where religious practice is maintained, a lot of these degenerate customs, especially materialistic belief, uh, don't seem to really be as strong. So I, I don't know, based on the historic record, I, I don't see how this can be blamed on Christianity itself, but rather on, uh, but rather just uh, its collapse. And this is another mistake, like ideas, this is a confusion too. And, I, and I'm not so sure that there needs to be an amendment here. Ideas cannot be responsible for their own abolition. It, it reminds me of this scene from the movie The Last King of Scotland, where the, the Scottish doctor is trying to convince Idi Amin not to kick out all of the Asians from Uganda because they're all the skilled laborers, they're all the accountants, they're all the tailors, they're all the doctors. And um, and he, he kicks them out anyway. And of course the economy collapses, right? And the, the, the doctor comes back to him and says, like, why did you do that? I told you not to. And the guy's like, well, sure, you had the right idea, but the idea wasn't good because it wasn't convincing to me. Um, this is like a magical thinking about ideas. Like, the idea is responsible for us not believing it anymore. This is nuts, right? Uh, leaders are responsible for, for, for not believing in the idea because they have agency. But the idea itself doesn't have agency. Like, it's not the idea. It's your, I, it's your responsibility to accept the idea, accept the truth, even when the truth is difficult. And so this, this idea that Christianity is responsible for its own abolition or its own non-belief is kind of nutty. It reminds me of, of Idi Amin talking about how the idea couldn't be good because it wasn't appealing. It's just, it's nuts magical thinking. And if you apply this logic fully, then I guess paganism is responsible for its own abolition as well, right? Because everyone converted away from it. This is not, you know, that has to be taken off the table. But, but if you want to convince me that there is something essential about Christianity that leads to materialism, I'm all ears. I don't know, it, but, but it's going to be a tough sell considering that Christianity is explicitly anti-materialist in its conception. And, you know, if we get, if we get to, you know, points where ideas that preach not A can be A, it opens up a whole other can of worms. So uh, we don't go there right now. Um, antimatter bone crusher. Um, great for ten dollars. Sorry if it's an old hat, but can you give an example of a good right wing response to win a bad versus uh to to a win versus a bad flex? You've mentioned that the left responds, "This isn't enough," which is their power to do. 
but that the lefty response to loan cancellation came off as childish and indignant. Thanks. Um, well, first of all, the left can flex because the left is in power. And this isn't enough isn't a flex. This isn't enough is a perfectly fine response. Actually, I encourage that. Um, so let me repeat this question. A good right-wing response to a win versus a bad flex. So a bad flex is where is where you make a claim to power that is where is where you make a claim to power that is not yours to command. So you know a, a and it, it it contrasts I mean there I don't think there really is any reason as a leader to 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 sort of parade ideas around in victory because I think responsible leaders remain maintain their stoicism but but when you actually win a battle this can be accomplished with with when you actually win the war i should say you know flexing on your enemies and saying i won and you lost and now you have to feel like you've lost this battle this is um this is something that you can do when you've actually won a war because you've actually secured power i would argue that it costs you but it feels good and the cost is very very little if you actually have power um there's almost nothing, there's almost zero times I can think of when, when the right really, ha there is utility in the right making the left feel like it has lost. In, in this world, there's really no utility in ever doing that because I haven't seen a point where the left has ever come close to losing the war. Um, the, the, the right's response the, the left's response to loan forgiveness was the correct one for its own purposes, which is this isn't enough because the left wants to have more money funneled into its own bureaucracy. The right wing's response to loan cancellation is this is bad policy, but who's counting? The, left's, the right's re correct response is we need to restructure the education institution because any attempt to make people pay for college while still issuing debts, while still issuing loans that are necessarily going to transform themselves into massive debts that the middle class holds, that's irresponsible. So the only right-wing response to, to this debt cancellation is to ask for a broader, a broader understanding of who ultimately owes these debts and who's going to pay for them. Rather than trying to, you know, be the good stewards of, of, of loan repayment, don't be the loan sharks for the Federal Reserve. Don't be the loan sharks for the, the university system. The, the, the problem at hand is a corrupt edu educational establishment and, and a predatory banking system. And until those guys pay the loans, there's no conversation to be had. And you're, you're not online for the mistakes of a system that you're actively dissenting against. You're just not. And, and in the meanwhile, because you're not responsible for a predatory system, you also can't flex when that predatory system takes a victory lap. And if you do, you're setting yourself up for, for a, uh, a big smackdown, I'd say. Um, Yeah, the good right-wing response to a meme is, I hope we can do better the next time, right? This might be a step on the next direction, but it's just not enough. That is the appropriate response. The bad response is, we've won now, uh, feel the burn, liberals, cope and seethe. Cope, seethe, and dilate, you know, that's a funny comeback. You can use it in Twitter, absolutely fine to do it in that way. But never use that in a way that makes you the implicit owner of power. You're not responsible for Ron DeSantis's stunts. And if he didn't dot his I's or cross his T's, if he didn't make sure that everyone who got on that plane ride to Martha's Vineyard didn't want to go to Martha's Vineyard, uh, then, you know, that's on him, right? He made a mistake. And, you know, that might be bad policy. But in the meanwhile... Uh, you can you can use this this incident with Martha's Vineyard to change the flow of the conversation, and just so I can you know really kind of cross my T's and dot my I's for this super chat question, the Martha's Vineyard thing should be obvious. 
progressives don't actually want welcome immigrants. They don't actually believe in welcoming immigrants. There's no way that the people of Martha's Vineyard couldn't put up 50 immigrants for more than 48 hours. There's no way they needed to call in the National Guard to get them to leave, as opposed to for them to just wait organically for them to leave. Uh, there's no way that that was necessary, and there's no way... And the fact that the rest of the, the, the progressive media doubled down and came to the defense of these rich people's complete inability to live up to the moral system that they propose, that just indicates that really no progressives believe in any of this stuff. And as long as you phrase it that way, you, you say, like, progressives don't believe in this unlimited compassion for immigrants, so let's have a conversation about immigrants where we actually talk about what we believe in, starting with the fact that this country does not actually benefit from immigration, and neither do the country, neither, neither do the countries where these immigrants are coming from. The whole system is insustainable and needs to be radically reformed. That's the path to a good conversation. Point out the fact that they don't believe what they're talking about and then invite people to a conversation where we just cut the crap. And you know, if, if they want to participate in that adult conversation, then you know, we can have that, but that, that, that doesn't need to go beyond that at all. Uh, GT3333 uh, for $10 USA. Are there any technical skill acquisition baskets uh, being woven? A community of distant engineers with hands and baskets of actual power is far more useful than one forever incensed armchair pun uh, incensed and being armchair pundits. The present is lost. If we are serious, if we are serious, we need to do the hard work required to win the future. Well, I certainly agree with that there. Um, Skill acquisition is a little bit difficult because I don't think we're big enough. Like, for instance, let's say you want to learn DevOps. Like, I kind of know DevOps and probably a few other people know DevOps. Um, but, you know, trying to catch one of the few people who are in the distant communities and, and then, like, get them to teach you DevOps, you know, or like Terraform or Infrastructure as Code or anything like that, that's not like you're, you're going to have a much easier time just going to Stack Overflow. And I mean, maybe if you want to build something with, I know a lot of people in the distant sphere are actively working on coding projects and there are ways to plug into that. I know some of the, the Sildings element server, the matrix servers have a lot of people that are running uh, repositories off of GitLab, which, you know, if you want to learn this technical stuff is a great place to start. And maybe you can learn by doing, but, you know, trying to use political communities to learn technical skills is at this point a little premature. Right now, we're just trying for the basic, you share interests and you share a broad geographic location with other people. And if you can establish that, I think you've got a beginning to something. Um... Yeah, hard work is required to win the future, but you know what? That that will have to be done. We're we're going to be making a lot of new friends when hardship hits. We're going to be making a lot of new friends. I imagine we're going to be forced to deatomize, perhaps in some radical ways. But what's always important to do is, while you're deatomizing, make sure that you're again. You know what's true. You know what ideas kill the old world, hopefully. And you know what behaviors ultimately lead to human degeneration. So while you're deatomizing, while you're, 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 you're putting yourself out there, uh, you're always breaking down the barriers that stand between these objectives. You're advancing proper ideas and you're slowly detaching yourself from practices that don't lead to broader health. That's, that's, that's the only way to do this. It's, it's to kind of keep, keep those three goals in tow. Uh, Margrave of Lackmark for $3. Thanks for the content, Dave. Well, you're very welcome. I always enjoy doing this. And I really hope to get my Substack essay out somewhat soon or whatever. Ben White for $5 USA. 
Went to the bar. Ho hey, it's Ben White's typical update. Uh, well, hey, this is deatomization, right? We're getting a status update for real world activity. But for $5 USA, he says, went to the bar with fellow young adults from a local Catholic church after adoration. And man, that is not my scene. It's really hard for me to connect to people I've never met before. How did young Dave do it? Did you frequent bars back then? Um, well, back in that day, going to bars with people post-adoration was totally my scene. I had a, we had a really great group of people who was into that and a, a lot of really great discussions back in the day. Um, I, I don't know. I, I imagine communities vary a lot. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm really sorry that you didn't hit off with those people. I might give it, a, I mean, maybe, maybe I would, might give it another chance. The, I, you don't give enough details on why uh, this would really wasn't your scene. Uh, maybe you don't like religious talk as much. Were they were they a bit too normie and their other uh, affections uh, for for things like mindless pop culture or whatnot? That can be a barrier sometimes. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I might give it a go again. I remember one time kind of coming into a religious community that, and they were reading some inane kind of uh, like ETWN Catholic thing that I thought was really stupid. And, um, you know, I kind of, I, so if, if I just, if I, if I had immediately balanced after that, I'm like, I, you know, this is just like basic Catholic theology. We're adults. Why are we reading this? This seems to be completely redundant. But then, you know, I, I, I went on and I read other books with them and they turned out to be really insightful and really curious and, you know, actually coming into grips with the challenges of modernity that we talk about all the time in this channel. It, it pays to be really curious about people, like understand how their own ideas form. You know, now that I'm, I'm talking about this, you know, there have been a few times again where I've been confronted with the neo pronouns um, and people complaining about people not using them. Um, like maybe it may be a good conversation to start up with is just to sort of avoid, uh, controversy is to just say something like, wow, you, you really must care about this gender thing. Like, how did you, how did you come to believe this yourself? Right. How did you get into this thing? I know I, I'm not really trying to be great friends with this person. Likely they're going to give me some talk about how they were inspired by gay marriage uh, to, to believe in sexual liberation as a new civil rights moment of our time. And, you know, I'll nod my head along with that and probably never talk to them again, but it will be interesting. But I, it's not so much that I, I think this is going to break them or, 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 or maybe I'll inter be able to introduce the seeds of doubt with some, some choice questions about how this process of their own uh, conversion kind of came about. Um, uh, the... Uh, the 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 bigger question is uh, the the bigger issue I should say the bigger thing that I'm kind of trying to put forward is develop a genuine curiosity about people when, when you're talking with them uh, try to get to the heart of what they actually believe like what are the experiences that led them to this thing even if you don't quite understand it like ETWN like its optics are terrible. Um, but but if you talk to people who really like it, uh, you'll see that it, it's actually kind of interesting. Like the founder, uh, is it Mother Angelica? I can't remember her her, her title, but it was a sister, an, an older um, an, an older sister who founded the channel, really under quite strange circumstances, and and they do excellent work in a variety of capacities. And and sure, you know, like this their production values aren't the best. And, and sometimes they, they get on this like mindless apologetics track. That's kind of, you know, it feels very, very like it's stuck in the 1980s. Uh, but, but there are some genuinely interesting stories there and you'll discover hidden depths that you can, uh, you know, no one's a boring person. There is no such thing as a boring person. Uh, there are people who don't let, who, whose interesting side is not breachable. But if you have a connection that is as deep as adoration is, I think that you have a thread there that you can tug and get to something deeper. And I wouldn't let go of that lightly. 
so I might encourage you to kind of like take a second look maybe, but that's just my advice, right? Yiz the eunuch. Speaking of blind spots, double click on this one, I think. Speaking of blind spots, we've been conditioned to have, uh, speaking of blind spots that we've been conditioned to have, I saw almost no coverage or outrage over how children and dogs started getting monkeypox. We are now worse than Weimar. Dark times ahead. Well, yeah, he is, but this, this falls into the problem that all of the COVID stuff have, which is that we see it, we suspect what the answer might be, but we can't prove it. So, um, you know, we can cover it, and, you know, certainly people like the Lotus Eaters have covered it, and it's been mentioned on a numerous right-wing podcasts that this um, the spread of monkeypox to various other people that shouldn't be getting it has some very dark implications. But the problem is that we can't prove it. And, and, and sort of sticking our necks out on that with an accusation is a sure way to get smacked down. Like, like for instance, like this dog might have just gotten it from bed sheets. I mean, dogs get cuts all the time when they're around house, houses. And so do... So do kids too, right? So like, you know, a kid gets a scrape and he gets in the bed sheets and like it could happen, you know? So, um, you know, you come out with an accusation and the next thing you know, you've got four doctors telling you that this is because of some open wound or something like that that's been verified. And then, you know, you're caught out. The more interesting stuff insofar if you want to make accusations that are worse than Weimar are the stuff that's come out with the children's hospitals because now we have them on record admitting that they do this stuff. And, and their, their only response to this is to like, I don't know what, purge the internet, get libs of TikTok banned. Like that, anything that you could definitively prove and that they're forced to admit as a course of fact, those are the only things you should really be making accusations over. Things that are more you know, speculative, you have to, you're a dissident. You're not a, a person on the mainstream. You're a, mis a false accusation hurts you uh, more than three correct accusations. So you have to be very, very careful about these assertions. But, but I totally agree, the implications are not good. Uh, GT333 for $5. I posted a question already, but here is an appreciation message as well. I'm a longtime lurker and thank you for the work that you've done. Well, um, again, you're very welcome and I appreciate people's super chats. Um, ben White for $3 USA. Thoughts on pursuing a master's degree in accounting or economics while working a full-time job. I'm not sure if they have time. Um, I'm not sure if they taught. I'm not sure if they time if the time sorry if the time I sacrifice for the masters will justify the potential benefits. Well, that's a hard question, and it totally depends on the industry you're in. Really, what I would do is I would go to your job, and I mean, if this is a job that you're intending to move in laterally, I I would. I, I would ask other people in your field what um, I would ask other people in your job what I mean certainly there are people in in your career path that have advanced to to a place where you would like to be at ask them what their path was to get there and try to follow that advanced degrees is tough uh, is accounting or economics um yeah, so so I guess it's hard to say because it totally depends on what industry you're in. So without knowing more details, I wouldn't be able to say. But if I were to choose accounting, uh, accounting is more promising because of the fact that there's a CPA attached to it. Like there's a certification degree. And certifications tend to have more weight in industry than do just raw academic degrees. Um, that being said, you know, going to school and working really sucks uh e even right now i have some academic work that i'm doing on the side in addition to me working 10 hours a day and it is draining 
uh, it, it, it absolutely drains my energy and it's not something, you know, and that throw a kid in, into the mix and it's, it's very, very difficult to manage this stuff. Um, but, but yeah, um, I, unfortunately I can't directly give you advice in that. My instinct is that a CPA a certification is valuable in most business enterprises, whereas a degree in economics really isn't. And, uh, but but that's that's my experience talking to boomers mainly and i have no idea if the value of a cpa on the market currently is going for very much however you know if you wanted to do like a, a sandy check on this go to the job boards and start searching them and filter for requirements and look at what how many of those job requirements have cpa requirements i imagine quite a few of them right and if that's the case uh, you know, you've got a place to start with what the jobs might actually want somebody who has accounting skills in that dimension. Okay, um, so here's Glow in the Dark for $10. An article from the Lotus Eaters, and I think speaks to some of the atomization of people. Liberal ideology is about autonomy and that... And, and that if you take it to its logical extreme, you get what is happening today with, with trans kids and the other, I'm adding this in, but other degeneracy. Um, yeah, that's, um, that's what Alex Kashuda has pointed to many times. First of all, the connection between liberalism and atomization is that we have to respect restrictions on ourselves. Um, and, and liberalism is directly opposed to that. And, and we're going to have to accept that and any any amount of deatomization is going to come with restrictions. We just have to make sure that they don't violate our principles and they don't encourage us to do things that are frankly unhealthy. And that they also don't encourage us to, to sort of participate in the same falsehoods that we've learned from, from, from very hard experience over the last few years lead to absolute societal ruin. Alex Kashuda also proposed that, that, that skepticism of the liberal world order and liberalism writ large is really sort of the, the minimum, it's really the minimum level you need to, to have in, in order to have a productive conversation with most people in this sphere. I mean, I, I can go to Adam and Sitch and make the case against liberalism again, as so many people have done, but 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 all I get is sort of this these sort of hatchling like arguments. I can't remember what you said five seconds ago. Uh, you're being evasive because you haven't answered questions I haven't asked, and uh, this constant reframing to the point where, you know, I was listening to Adam and Sitch. You know, someone forwarded me a clip, and um, they they can't even repeat. The they, they can't even get the arguments of the distant right or of broader neo reaction straight. Uh, that they can't they can't even correctly repeat them, and um, I think this is ultimately going to hurt the centrists. I think it will become apparent that they're not operating in good faith when they do this continuously. But I, I don't know what more what argument further do we need about liberalism and its corrosive effects. At this point, I guess people just need to see this manifest in their own lives more as our as our order crumbles around us. Um, Scratchy McDump Waffle, again for $3. From one nerd to another, you should really check out Neo Genesis Evangelion. I think you'd like it. Well, I've seen Neo Genesis Evangelion like when I was in high school and when I was a high school anime nerd. So, I mean... Yeah, I think that it's, among the animes, it's one of the better ones, certainly. It uh, has sort of Freudian elements and mystic Christian elements in it as well. There, Evangelion alludes to it right up the front. There's also the sort of Kabbalistic structure, the Sephiroth you see, I think, in the opening credits. And, of course, there, there's, there's, there's ideas like, um, uh, you know, there's, there's various mystical elements that appear in the angels themselves and and, and the and the, the consciousness uh the subconscious dimension of the evangelions the giant robots uh ultimately does it really say anything um 
I don't know. It's tough, right? The the problem is is that it tried to. It, my memory of this is like 15 years old, but but my problem is is that a, a few things. Uh, first of all, it's a mecha anime, and um, I get what it was trying to do. It was like, well, let's make a mecha anime where the giant robots are really secondary to the psychological states of uh, the characters involved. And, and that's kind of cool, right? There's sort of an Ender's Game vibe to Neon Genesis Evangelion. That's really cool. The second thing they try to do is like, okay, what if we have, um, not, only are, not only is the subconsciousness of the characters important to the plot, it's also important to how the, the robots themselves operate and to the origins of the monsters themselves, right? And, and so what you're seeing play out on screen in the battles is literally a psychological and spiritual battle. Um, that's, that's also an important component to it. And, and there's sort of an interesting marriage of those two things, but then it's also like it's in, intermixed like in, in this sort of very interesting psychological story of the end times. So like the Book of Revelations is, is this kind of like stupid... Um, like coming of age story where you've got like, you know, these hot girls that are circulating around this kind of like adolescent young man who's like, again, he's like this perfect hero and his dad just doesn't appreciate him. It, it kind of feels like, you know, your, your typical, your typical 15 year old guy feeling sorry for himself. And um, I, I don't know. It, it felt a little indulgent in that dimension. And anime always has this this problem where where it feels like it's indulging juvenile impulses at the same time it's reaching for higher spirituality and it's unclear whether it really understands the spirituality or the spiritual implications that it's it's, it's summoning with all of these like grand symbols and because of that I'm always a little suspicious um, glow in the dark for three dollars. Academia has given up on virtue because it's it's academia has given up on virtue because it's too hard and they are for vice or pleasure for they have no other motivations. Yeah, that's certainly true. Certainly, I'm not the first to think that that academia is totally corrupted by the need to constantly be publishing and justifying grant money. And because of that, like a lot of really you know, a lot of really weak results get published and, you know, I'm a PhD student, so maybe I benefited from that. Uh, you know, the paper mill is the paper mill and PhDs are PhDs and they need to get published and and that that is what it is. But, but really in all of this, across academia and across academic disciplines, the things that really need to be said in an increasing number of disciplines just can't be said. To the extent that you have the expert consensus being presented in a core mainstream media mouthpiece telling everyone that the biological reality has been debunked and to stop believing their own lying eyes. It's absolutely insane. So, I mean, I just agree with this. Creeper Weirdo for USA $10. So recently people have got this wacky idea that AI will one day be able to create its own art. I hate this idea. It feels creepy and anti-human to me, and a gross disrespect to art and beauty. Why do people believe these silly things? Well, creepy weirdo, a uh, creeper weirdo, I appreciate the super chat, and I sympathize with you in the fact that I think we need to get out AI out of the art creation. Uh, but but just like, you know, I think the the belief that AI can create art is um i mean it can create things that trick people into thinking it's art done by a human so I, i'm afraid I, I i regret to inform you that i think we've passed the turing test on this one you can have ais create art and submit it in art competitions and have it win art competitions now maybe this says something bad about our own artistic taste and i certainly think that in the future it, art will need to be we'll need to have proof that it's actually made by humans in order to take, to be convinced that we're, we're, our own emotions are not being deceived. 
by a machine learning algorithm, but but um, I'm not wondering why people believe AI can create art. It, it can fool people into thinking that what it's created has been drawn by an actual person, which means that that people believing it, um, it it's it's sort of a deeper philosophical question. But thank you for the super chat. Um, Benway for three dollars USA. Thoughts on Trump and the Republican and Republicans in general, basically accepting LGBT community. What good are Republicans? For, what good are Republicans for anymore? What even are their values at this point? Where well, Republicans' values are whatever they can get away with. They are the outer party. They have to do what was done twenty years ago, because the civil rights legislation basically makes not doing that functionally illegal. If Republicans can't get diversity in their ranks, they immediately have a hard time with organizing uh, because of, 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 of diversity requirements, because of equal opportunity requirements. This is something that's a, a priority for, for all organizations that, uh, that are sort of subject to civil rights regulations, which, which I do believe are things like PACs and things like and, and political organizations to a certain extent. Maybe not the parties themselves, and because the the civil rights legislation keeps on moving forward in law, ba every time Democrats take office, the Democrat the Republicans have no option but to follow the Overton window with them. The only response is to completely reframe and to and to not talk about LGBTQ as identity groups, just talk about behavior. I don't recognize trans people. I recognize people that take cross-gender hormones uh, because they want to, because they have a religious impulse, because they feel it makes them more comfortable, uh, because they have a sexual fetish, because they have a dysphoria. All those reasons are reasons for them taking these drugs, for them getting these surgeries. Uh, you know, but that's, you know, that is what it is. It's a behavior and a motivation. It's not an identity group that I recognize. It's a reality because I don't think it's well-defined or well-conceptualized. And nothing, I don't see why I should accept this frame. So I just don't. And, and the Republican Party might just have to die before we can fix this thing. But but we'll, we'll ultimately see where this goes. Yeah. Aaron McIntyre is is great at kind of demonstrating continuously how how this is how the Republican Party is basically just the uh, the conservative movement in retreat constantly day after day. Glow in the dark for five dollars. Don't you just love it when the left and neocons keep saying things about how we aren't very Christian when the right does something the left and neocons disapprove of? Yet none of the ones. Yet none of the ones who are saying it are Christian themselves. Weird, huh? huh? Example, Martha's Vineyard stunt. Yeah, I mean, this is the great... The, this is always the irritating... This is the meme, right? Oh, hey, guys. You need to charitably do this thing that will benefit my side politically because Jesus said to turn the other cheek or something. No, I'm not a Christian. I have nothing but contempt for your beliefs. But maybe if I say this one thing, you'll do what I want. And, you know, there's there's huge offenders to this. Just, I mean, just point out that the people who use this aren't Christian and that they don't believe what they're saying. And that, that we're, we're only, I'm only in it to have conversations with people who actually believe what they're saying. Not people who are just copying a pose because other people can retweet it and they can look smart on social media. I, I'm just tired of people performatively effusing about politics. And that's what all of these things are. It's all words. It's all posing for the camera. It's doing cell things in front of the parking lot so you can see, seem like this charitable person who's, who's distraught over kids in cages and then not caring about it nine months later. That's what this is. And just, just just calling what out what this behavior is in the proper frame is going to do way more for you uh, than than sort of trying to argue them through some kind of, you know, this is again, like what Fritz, Fritz said, like, well, we have to fight over Christianity politically. 
you know, he, but, but we really can't. Uh, we can't quote Christian theology back on this because this has never been about Christian theology. This is new atheism was never about uh, apologetics. This is about uh, this is about a certain perspective that makes modern people feel smug over over their ancestors and and over their immediate political rivals. And I, I'm refusing to participate in this lie anymore. I don't want to have conversations that are fake these fake conversations right you know i mean uh, that's that's the thing that's what we should say to everything let's just stop having fake conversations just writ large just just tell me cut the crap and tell me what you actually believe if you think we should have an energy crisis over 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 climate regulations because we refuse to build nuclear just say that if you think we need, this is the time to get rid of nitrogen-based fertilizers and are willing to buy the consequences, just say that. And I'll tell you my perspective back again. Um, Scotty McDumpwaffle, third time. Uh, yes, I challenge you to a game of 40K. Their dark gods are first to my devotion to the ruinous powers. You can play Tabletop Simulator. Um, hey, well, okay, I, I do have Tabletop Simulator. Maybe I should start up that. Uh, uh, DM me on Telegram, I guess. <laughs> it's been a while since I played Tabletop Simulator, and I'm not much... I think I might have played... I've only played like a handful of games of Warhammer in my entire life. Don't Isn't the whole point, though, to like actually physically move models around so you're not doing everything on the computer? That's one of the reasons... I mean, I, I mean, you're a community member, so you know maybe I'll I'll try to make time for you, obviously. Uh, but but I I really don't like playing games on the computer when I can play them in real life, right? That's kind of the whole reason for loving board games is that you're doing things with physical things in the real world. But anyway, thank you very much. Uh, Glow in the dark for USA twenty dollars. Enlightenment is the foundation of secularism and modern atheism. Eggheads want exactly... Enlightenment is the foundation for secularism and modern atheism. Eggheads... Eggheads want actually... Eggheads want actually... Kings don't have a mandate from God, and society is based on artificial social structures. They took facts out of context... And since no one actively thought about how to structure society except on a macro scale, it was more organic than they had to admit. And yeah, this is also the problem is that um, because Christianity was so strong in the lower orders and because the Enlightenment emerged out of the, the most devout Christian time imaginable, uh, there, there, there couldn't be a way to test this proposition in any meaningful way. Uh, it, society they could take away some of the superstructures and society would keep on going into, until society actually de-Christianized and now we're in the shit we're in right now. So, um, yeah, I think it's going to be really, really obvious that, that the modern society is just, is just incapable of talking seriously or engaging seriously with real problems. Um, cheers, Dave. So Sam153 for $10 USA. Cheers, Dave. Good talk tonight. I'm still sincerely hoping for a global American empire loss, a gay loss in the blue-yellow conflict. Um, it is true that a GAE loss in the blue-yellow conflict would be the would be less bad for dissidents because if, if the global American empire wins, they're going to feel confident to start striking back at their enemies in Europe and America and tightening screws of power structures they felt had been kind of coming unstuck. But that being said, do not root for a side in this war publicly. You can point out the fact that certain events would be beneficial to our side. You can... Um, you can talk about what would happen if either of the side wins. But remember, we do not have a dog in this fight. Vladimir Putin is not our friend. He, he's, not, he's not even remote. He's not even sort of our ally or our co-belligerent 
in, in the same way that, you know, pagans might be co-belligerents with Christianity. Uh, he's just somebody who's brought about a certain moment in history by which bad things will happen if he screws up with us and, and, and things will evolve in a probably a pretty poor way if, 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 if he loses. But that does not mean we root for him. This is just something that is happening. It's like the current hurricane. It could go west. It could go east. And maybe if it goes east, it hits the city and it goes west and it goes out to sea or whatever. Uh, but this is... This is not within our control, and we should not be rooting about it publicly. And it, it's unseemly for denizens of a certain country to root for a foreign power to win a war when, when, when we are not actively aiding in that war or willing to fight in it ourselves. And I wouldn't fight in this war on either side of this conflict. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, send, I wouldn't go to fight in that war. I certainly wouldn't send my son to fight in that war. And I wouldn't want to send any of my uh, family members to fight on either side of this war. And so it's unseemly for me to root for either side. I just recognize the reality of the global American empire's destructiveness and its vindictiveness to its political opponents, which include me, not from my own election, but from theirs. And, and because of that, I, I have to just acknowledge that it's probably a bad thing if they feel confident and they feel like they're in a position to crush their enemies, both domestically and across uh, Europe. And so I, I acknowledge that simply as a fact, as a neutral fact of something that I just can't control. All right, thank you very much, Rennie Coppard, for $3 Canadian. Um, I double click this one since it's a question. That didn't work. I wonder why. Remy Coppard. Is evil caused by people who think that they're, they, they are doing good when they're actually doing evil? Or are there people who know they're doing evil but still do it because they want to cause evil in the world? Um, great question. So ultimately, the answer is yes in both regards. And it's complicated. So, I don't think that anybody, I don't think that the human mind is capable of, of making a decision that they don't see procuring some good end. Even hedonism is procuring some good end. Evil is always caused by somebody choosing something that they, that they know to be a lesser good over a greater good. So, you know, if you... Um, you know, just in the Andrew Sullivan example, like if you use pornography, uh, because you know when you're married, that is an evil because you're you have a sexual urge that that should that should have a proper release, and you're ignoring that uh, to basically indulge in something that even if you weren't married would be gross and degenerate. Uh, the pleasure itself is good; it's it's the violation. Uh, it's the betrayal, it's, it's the denigration that's bad, that, 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 makes, that makes the entire action itself evil. But, but pleasure in the abstract is not bad. It's the fact that it is accomplished through a commission of evil. So in the abstract, in the Aquinas sense, evil is simply the choice of the lesser good. That being said, we, when we commit a deliberate act of wickedness, you can do some pretty evil things and, and actually convince yourself uh, and you can kind of sense that you're doing evil when you're doing it. There, there are the sins of weakness, like the pornography example. Um, but there, but there are also, I mean, like this, like this, you can, you can feel yourself get tempted, like vengeance, for instance, that's almost a more demonic thing, a more demonic desire. And this is more than, Pornography. This is always what rage is. What constantly plagues my mind. I know that wrath is a sin. I know that vengeance is evil. And in the event that I actually got power, which I won't, but in the event that any right wing figure got power, you just want to see some of these people horribly punished. For instance, 
in the event that there was an actual right wing victory, like a permanent one, it would be unnecessary to severely punish the doctors that performed transgender surgeries on children. It would be unnecessary, and given the fact that the doctors themselves were lied to, it's, it's questionable how much they knowingly committed an action of mutilation. Um, that being said, they did commit an act of child mutilation. They are committing acts of child mutilation. And so, you know, there's this little, there's this little ditty, right? This, the, what, 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 what consequence should a mutilator get in, in, in the court of justice? And then there's this little ditty that comes from Andrew Sullivan's The Mikado, where it goes, I have always decided that the punishment should fit the crime, the punishment should fit the crime, the punishment should fit the crime. And when you think in that Hammurabi way, the eye for an eye way, suddenly all sorts of very supremely ironic punishments uh, emerge in your mind as, as proper ways to obtain vengeance on these people who are mutilating children. And um, you know, it doesn't take your, your very angry mind to go from that revelation to all sorts of evil places. Uh, but but those thoughts are evil, right? Like you're 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 you are in indulging in in a desire for justice, but really all you're all, all you're really indulging in is is your chimpanzee idea that you want to see your enemies crushed before you, and that's not good. It's not healthy, and it does not actually bring us any closer to resolution than we are right now, unless we're actually and it. it, it in, unless we're in some radically different situation than we are right now, uh, a certain amount of righteous anger is fine, uh, but 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 tracking into revenge fantasies is it, just—it's very vindictiveness is not something that you should sucker in your heart, and you should certainly not let it rule you to a way that you actually commission something that's evil that does not manifestly bring justice forward into this world. Maybe the pagans see something differently, right? I've, I heard from Survive the Jive that vengeance is a responsibility for pagans. If, if that's the case, and this vengeance is carried out, say, for instance, in a very pagan way, the same way that it was portrayed in the film The Norseman, uh, I, as both a Christian and a sort of an Aristotelian rationalist, would have some questions about the, the sort of logic and, and humaneness of this action, and even whether it, it makes sense in a spiritual sense. But but that's probably a conversation for another day. Um, Glow in the Dark for $10 USA. Part one, cultural manipulation and, uh, and degeneration by left wing. Dave went unto Ottoman Sitch to see liberalism has flaws. They scoffed. Then liberalism justified trans kids. Dave went unto Adam and Sitch again, saying, Look, liberalism's flaws have made manifested. And Adam and Sitch said, It was but a passing fancy of the SJWs. <laughs> this sounds biblical. <laughs> See, Pharaoh, what crimes your liberalism has wrought upon the people. Will you now not repent of your liberalism and join classically ethical people seeking a solution in more traditional modes of governance? <laughs> But Pharaoh hardened the heart, sorry, but God hardened the heart of, of Adam and Sitch. <laughs> and they continued to make their mindless liberalist content that had absolutely no understanding of reality. Um, I don't know. Just a year ago, these people were, were simping for Biden. So I don't even, or just two years ago, they were completely in the tank for Biden. So I, I really don't know what to say. Um, but uh, but thank you very much for that very biblical rendition of of, of the the conversation. I'll, I'll continue to move on. Um, John Blitz for three dollars USA. We need to capitalize on the anger woke Hollywood is creating. Normies care about Tolkien and Star Wars changing. Odds say that's where we can make some inroads or in ground. Um, I'm not familiar familiar with making some in ground. I assume you mean making some inroads, but maybe that's a different way of saying the same thing. Um, yeah, I guess. I mean, haven't normies been upset at woke culture for like three or four years now? 
they don't buy it the same way. And, and the problem is like what... <sighs> I mean... What, what's the conversation? The conversation is that the current Lord of the Rings sucks. That's sort of the level that Adam and Sitch are on right now. So, so where do you go from there? Um, get them to understand what exactly? Because the Normie's natural response is to go back to the 90s, is to go back to the 80s, is to go back to the ideology of the 80s. But, but getting them to understand that the reason why the Lord of the Rings sucks now is that the, the, the ideas that were tried in the 80s did not work and needed to be replaced. And thanks to other ideas, other decisions we made earlier in our development, the only place they could go was in the woke direction. Um, I tried to have this conversation three times with Adam and Sitch, and they blocked me. So, and, and that was my biggest contact to the normie world, to normies that actually discuss ideas outside of people that I meet on, you know, just in my day-to-day -day life. Um, you're right, the normies are slowly getting disillusioned, but I'm not so sure what that conversation is that follows that disillusionment because they're still in the mode of consume product, get excited for next product. And as long as they're in that mode and not willing to interrogate things more deeply, I'm not so sure what there really is to say. I mean, Adam and Sitch's fan base are really the problem as it stands right now because that fan base just wants to be entertained and they want to be entertained in the notion that there is some political force that can re-correct us back to the 1990s. This cannot happen. And when, when I tell them this, they don't want to believe it. And they, they don't want to believe it because it's scary to believe it. And if they believe that this is not the case, that they have to start questioning more deep elements of the world that they grew up in. And, and for so many people, that's it's a bridge too far at this stage in their development. Maybe when they see more things in the real world, they'll have a, have a different take, but we can keep on going. Um, I'm sorry, I deselected that one. <laughs> oh, well, okay, so the biblical passage continues with part two. Then the liberals justified um, minor attracted persons, and Dave went on to Adam and Sitch again, saying, you must acknowledge liberalism as liberalism and all of its flaws. Adam and Sitch screamed, this isn't real liberalism. Then the decay was too great and society fell. Then Adam and Sitch went to Dave and asked, why didn't you warn us? <laughs> why did, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I don't think that Listen, I actually don't know what, what happens when this, if the system were actually to seriously collapse, what would the, I don't know what the cope would be. Uh, I think that there'll be some kind of, like, it, it really threatens to become some kind of nostalgic cult of the past, a cult of the world that was. And I don't, I don't really want to go back to any world. No age that I lived through would I want to live in again because I feel like I know now uh, there were just sort of inevitable historical developments. And, and the only way that we can go forward is to look for the inevitable historical developments that are coming down the line for us and make sure that they happen faster. Uh, part of that's going to be a, a sort of foundational economic and legal collapse of the Western world order which will happen very, very, very slowly, even with the coming energy crisis. This is just the beginning. And that will cause a lot of people to drop off. But what people are looking for is, okay, if I depart from the hive mind, if I depart from the egregore, if I break faith with the cathedral, if, if I take a bite out of all of these scary ideas, uh, what do I have to look forward to? Who are my new people? Who is my new community? Uh, can we answer that successfully? That's one of the next steps, certainly. But anyway, thank you for the super chat. I think last two, and then we read the poem of the night. 
Asteroidal Assassin for $5 USA. You asked a while ago how I could be um, you asked a while ago how I could be an anarchist and socially conservative. My answer is the fact that people have socially conservative impulses. Social pressure and religion will make people more virtuous. I mean, I guess if you could have bought, I mean, if you, yeah, I just, I don't, I don't think, I think that you're, you're kind of mistaking something that can only come about in from, from, for, for sort of a very long history of government. Like limited government could only be produced after a long history of being governed by Christian orders that's what, what that's what made it that's what made limited, limited government possible for a brief period between 1700 and at the latest 2020 uh, these conditions rely on all sorts of things that i'm not sure can exist without government i'm not so sure that that in conditions of hardship people will not create governments and sovereignty sovereign organizations themselves. They will band together with the ability to use force and then whether you like it or not, you've got a government. Government, And if the government can't rule effectively, it's going to apply that force. And I don't know. I mean, it's going to apply that force in ways that embody a law and the law is going to be oriented towards teaching people to live in virtuous ways. Um, and furthermore, I just, I just, I don't think you can get, you can't get past that quote in Master and Commander where, uh, was it lucky Captain Jack Aubrey says definitively, men must be governed. Men must be governed. There can be no revolution inside the world of this ship. And, and that's what I always think of when I hear about anarchism. I don't know what superstructures you have, but the idea that every person can be an autonomous lord, maybe in some past Hebraic age of wonder, all men could be their own judges of the written word of God, and we were all these virtuous actors and patriarchs of our own flocks. But for, for the most part, human beings fall under the direction of some collective organization. This collective organization, in turn, needs to seek succor from a, a sovereign, which in turn imposes laws on it. And once we're in that position, the laws have to embody a morality. And I don't think that there's any such thing as value neutrals government. government. And... I guess you can describe that as anarchism, like minimal val, minimum, um, I should say, a minimum size government with the absolute minimum number of values imposed through law on on free association, hypothetically. Uh, but this this is a pure hypothetical style of government that has never existed on Earth, to my knowledge, and I don't see how it ever could be practically implemented. So for that reason, um, I don't know, for good reason, I think anarchy is kind of associated with uh, leftist anarchy or with just pure Hobbesian anarchy. Oh, no, another super chat. Okay, last super chats, guys. Um, I want to try to finish this. Oh, my God, it's already very, very late. Um, Nerve AMV maker uh, for $5. To Ben White, unless you want to go into academia, then economics is worthless. Accounting, finance, or business is much better. Yeah, m my instinct from talking to boomers is that it's it, it really goes CPA is the most useful, like a, a, an MBA maybe, but then again, what you get from an MBA really depends on the schools and the context you make with a ba MBA, and then economics degrees are only for, uh, like if you want to get a PhD or something like that in the current academics. So other, otherwise, they have very limited applications. Okay, glow in the dark for five dollars. Wrath, when performed to bring forth justice, can be used for good, but to dwell on wrath is bad. 
Also, many of the pro-trans doctors are clearly not doing it for the good of the kids. They are more activists than doctors, or at least, or at least the visible ones are. Yes, yes, and a just system would have to take that into consideration in, in the advent that, that true justice does come to these people, glow in the dark. But when we get angry at these people and fantasize about their punishments in, in all sorts of, um, you know, d deliciously, deliciously uh, hemorrhagic ways, we could say, <laughs> um, that's not justice. It's not, justice is calm. And justice is, justice right now is giving testimony to the victims that they have created and offering them repentance. Because I don't think that there is a body ready to wield justice to, to the scale you would need to, to get to the heart of who's really responsible for this travesty. And, you know, this is, um, I don't, I don't think that we are, we're the, the, you know, this is, um, it's like the Andrew Sullivan's porn example or, or jealousy, right? Like, Whenever the devil comes to you with a sin, he always has some justification ready to hand. You know, oh, oh, look at all those other content creators that, that are going professional. That could have been you. Or, oh my God, this sexual urge is just overpowering. There's no way you could resist it. Or, oh, guess what? Your sadism is just a desire for justice made manifest. Um, these have all happened to me. Uh, these, these, this is sin masquerading as virtue, and everyone knows it's sin masquerading as virtue. Um, last few, uh, Leo Gened. Click. Hello, Dave. I'm making the preparations to create an epic YouTube channel that's a mix of history and cool animation. I hear you say that most history YouTube channels have a hollow way of teaching history. What would be a good way to tell all these stories in a more meaningful way? Well, the, the two, the, and I don't know exactly, animation makes it difficult, but I think that like, um, there, there's two ways to kind of make history meaningful. And I think our education system kind of misses them, right? Uh, the, the first way that history is meaningful is through the timeline. Uh, yes, this along with rote memorization is the one thing that we've, um, it, 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 we've discarded this in modern education. I really think it's a problem, but the, the most important thing students of history can generate in their own minds is a rough idea of when everything happens sequentially, such that when they hear of a new thing happen, they can situate it in between other events that have happened on the timeline. And what oftentimes helps in this process is imagining every age in sort of a dialectic with every other age, like in conversation. So you can see Richard the Lionheart having an argument with Saladin, who in turn is having an argument with... Um, I don't know. Uh, uh, Dante Alighieri is a hundred years later, but but close at, close at hand, right? This is a process, uh, you know, or he's he's having an argument with the authors of the Magna Carta, for instance, which is another contemporary circumstance there, uh, and, and you can get the the timeline straight in your mind that way. Um, so so that, that that that's a very valuable thing, but it involves learning dates, and it's probably more of a tool for history teachers. For YouTube channels, history is always taught through story. Um, history is comprised of stories that have inside of them lessons, that have inside of them heroes, and that have inside of them human tragedies. And, and these lessons and human tragedies reflect, for that age, they prefigure things that are happening in our own age, or they reflect, for that age, things that 
we currently observe in, in our own age and, and suffer through in our own age. And so drawing out specific stories and populating them with, with heroes and villains and, and situating them in a particular landscape is, is, um, is important. I think that, you know, I mean, and, um, like, for instance, I, I mean, like, the story of Lepanto has a lot of heroes, has a lot of villains. But I think it begins, it begins with two artifacts that we have in our own age. The Rosary and the, the Virgin of Guadalupe. Both of which play roles. I'm not talking about the, the, the one from Mexico. But she plays a role in the, the Battle of Lepanto, the battle that saved basically Europe, both southern and northern, from being invaded by Islam. And um, that story where you can see objects that exist in our current reality uh, being integrated into, into a historical battle of absolute significance is something that I think very few people will forget. And, and that could be c carried through an animation. You know, okay. Creeper Weirdo for $5 USA. One last question. How do you create relevant but also respectful Christian art? I see people trying to, but it all, but it kind of scares me. Um, well, I think that the, the way you create relevant Christian art is to hold your faith lightly and let it settle organically. The art you create either has to be explicitly religious, like 100%. This is like a religious icon, a religious story, a religious art. These are just, and these are the stories we tell. Or religion has to settle into the background of telling the truth. I'm telling a story about a family. They happen to be Catholic. These are how Catholics behave that I have seen. Or they happen to be Jewish. Or they happen to be Muslim. Uh, well, I guess the Jewish and Muslims, makes, you asked about Christian or right? But, but they, they happen to be, I don't know, An Anabaptists. They happen to be uh, Quakers or something like that, right? You know, um, if, if the religion settles into the background as an organic element of the story then then it kind of um it can permeate the story and, and its truths can be exposed from the true human moments that emerge what what oftentimes people are allergic to is the very modern evangelical way of having a story that's not religious on its cover and then having like an on the nose apologetic argument appear halfway through it or having like not so subtle Christian iconography or images injected into it, like through a dialogue from a character that would never happen in real life. Um, look to things like Cormac McCarthy uh, or Dostoevsky or another one of my favorite artists, Flannery O'Connor. If you're looking for, um, if you're looking for a great Christian short story writer who who's stories are infused with Christianity, but, but, but that Christianity does not seem on the nose or out of place, even though they're just direct Christian allegories, pretty much. Flannery O'Connor is a great place to start to see how it's just so deftly integrated. It's deftly folded into the narrative at all levels. Uh, she, I think Jesus literally appears as a subject of conversation in probably like a good 40% of her stories. And, and still, the secular audiences, they don't seem offensive. They seem organic and true and, and raw. So there's, there's I think that, that you probably could go to examples like that. You, you really either have to decide whether you're creating a, a religious analogy like Pilgrim's Progress and then just own it, or you have to um, create an organic story that exposes themes of Christianity and introduces Christianity just in an organic way as part of telling the truth about your subject, about the thing you're describing in art. 
Okay. All right. I'm sorry. This is a corrective one. Uh, last super chat of the night. Leo Ganad for three. Ganid for three dollars USA. P.S. You pronounce my name wrong in every single super chat. I don't want to correct this because it's entertaining to hear all the ways my name could be possibly mispronounced. So is it Leo Ganid? Ganid. <laughs> so. Last time I was on with the super with the Franklin, the Franklin asked people to super chat me words that I would knowingly mispronounce. Now I've caught a bunch of grammatical errors in the super chats tonight, but this is the first example of a well, I guess it's a proper word at least that I just can't pronounce. So congratulations, you stumped me, and I look forward to mispronouncing your name in super chats in the future. Um, but that being said. Uh, this is the end of the live stream. So I am now picking out the poem of the night, which you may have caught from uh, the blurb on the, uh, at the at the beginning of the stream is Emily Dickinson's very famous poem, Because I Could Not Stop for Death. Uh, this is her most famous poem, uh, great poet, um, and I, I have no shame of reading the most popular poems of a popular poet. And I was waiting for the event of, of death to read this poem. And certainly, rest in peace, Queen Elizabeth. Everyone keep her soul in your prayers and, and the souls of um, uh, those also departed. And, and prayers for the new monarchs of Britain. May they guide their nation back to greatness. And, and the people back to uh, virtue and back to God. But, but here is a, a much more secular meditation on death uh, from the poet Emily Dickinson. Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held but just ourselves and immortality. We slowly drove, he knew no haste, and I had put away my labor and my leisure too, for his civility. We passed, we passed the school where children strove at recess in the ring. We passed the fields of gazing grain. We passed the setting sun. Or rather, he passed us. The dews drew quivering and chill. For only gossamer, my, crap, my gown, my tippet, only tulle. We paused before a house that seemed a swelling of the ground. The roof was scarcely visible, the cornice and the crown. Since then, tis centuries, and yet feel shorter than the day. I first surmised the horse's head towards eternity. And with that, I'll say good night for this edition of Broadcasts from Fiddler's Green. I hope to see you all next week. Please leave suggestions for the topic, and I will see you later. Have a wonderful rest of the evening and a blessed week. Good night. Mm -hmm.